Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm spending the day with the lovely and talented Raleigh Klotzek, one half of Wild Crafted Workshop. Raleigh, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. You too as well. So if you're not familiar with Raleigh, Raleigh, like I mentioned a moment ago, is one half of Wild Crafted Workshop. The other half of that being her husband, Oliver Klotzek. Now, Raleigh is originally from the good old US of A. And I just realized before we started filming that Riley is officially the first American maker that I'm collaborating with. That's it. We should have had an award where I could just hand it, <laughs> handed it to you in celebration. So obviously, hopefully the first of many, uh, but Riley, yeah, Rishi hails from the US. We'll, we'll get into a conversation in a moment to learn more about Riley's background more specifically. Now, what it is, uh, Riley's background is actually, she's a full-time craftswoman. She, like I said, hails from the US. She's currently living in Sweden, but she spends a lot of time in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. She makes full time. She also teaches full time as well across Europe and in the US. So in this particular video, what we're going to be looking at is Riley's process for turning a wooden bowl on this pole lathe, right? That we're gonna see behind us. Now, as you can see from the length of this video, this is a very long video, and that's because there were a lot of steps involved in this process. Normally, when Raleigh and other makers teach uh, turning, it's usually a four day course, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to condense as much as we can into this video to hopefully share that information with you, should you be a complete beginner, intermediate, or even an advanced. Now, what we're going to be doing is a couple of things. We're gonna start from looking at the bowls, some example bowls that Raleigh has turned, so you can kind of get an idea of what's possible. And then we're gonna get started from literally a raw piece of wood, and we're gonna work through the entire process all the way to a finished bowl and talking about the finishing, yeah. right, of the bowl itself. Exactly. Now, a couple of things to kind of mention before we get rocking and rolling with the rest of this video. As you can see, this video is time stamped into different sections of this video, depending on what topic is being talked about. Now, if you look below in the description, all those timestamps are listed out. On the left-hand side of that, you will see all the actual times. YouTube has a very cool feature. If you click on that time, the video will jump straight to that particular section. So this is hopefully helpful as a resource for you moving forward when you're watching this video and referring back to it. Secondly, what we're gonna do is, you know, I'm going to put a link to Raleigh's website and social media where they have a plethora of information about all the training that they do, the wares that they sell, etc. Um, and finally, I need to mention that this video is actually part one of a two-part series. So in this part one, we're going to be looking at Raleigh's entire process for turning a wooden bowl on a pole lathe. And in part two, Oliver Klotzek, Raleigh's husband, yes. <laughs> is going to be teaching and showing his process for forging the actual hook tool that's used for turning a wooden bowl on a pole lathe. I know it's a bit of a tongue twister, all of that, right? But that's what we're gonna be doing. So if you wanna check out part two this, to this video, which I highly recommend you do, a link to that will be down below in the description. And we're also gonna look at an example now because it's gonna be with that same tool that Riley's going to be turning in this video. Now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna now first look at some examples of bowls and then we're gonna crack on with the rest of this video. So Riley, with your kind permission, shall we begin? Let's do it. Right, <laughs> guys. I hope you enjoyed this video where Riley Klotzek is going to be teaching you how to turn a wooden bowl on a pole lathe. So Riley, yeah. we're going to begin the video. I think first thing we will mention is the location we're filming it is a woodland belonging to Jill Swan. Yes. Where we're filming. So we want to say a huge thank you to Jill for allowing us to use her space. Um, and fingers crossed, it doesn't rain. Yes. <laughs> it's been raining a lot uh, in recent weeks here in the UK. So before we actually look at some examples of bowls, I think it's important to take a moment to talk about you as a maker for those that may not be familiar with you. So would you like to talk a little bit about your background and what brings you to crafting full time? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I've definitely had busy hands my whole life and started crafting and making things very young. Um, I went to a Steiner school, Waldorf school, which very much influenced or like nurtured that fa uh, part of myself as well. So following um, high school, I actually uh, was 
in a jewelry business with my mom and was working with making things very regularly, a lot of fine detail. And within that time, I like knew that I wanted to make some kind of career within craft and started looking for, or like, I don't know, just paying attention to other crafts that felt like I could track the beginning and ending of the resources that were used as, used because it felt harder with jewelry and stumbled into woodworking actually uh, carved a spoon at like a nature bushcrafty kind of event back uh, 10 years ago uh, using a dry piece of firewood and a coal burn bowl and a dull knife <laughs> and then following that experience one I just I got completely hooked and through Instagram found that a bunch of people actually do this not just for fun but also for work and that slowly trickled into the green woodworking world. I think I first really learned about that about eight years ago and back in 2018 I came to the UK and did some work exchanges and other time spent with makers here. I think I just mass emailed a bunch of people that I could find online and luckily got to spend some time at Brookhouse Woods with Will St. Clair and then I was within the space as with Yoav um, and I never learned turning directly from him but I would accredit a lot of the learning just from being present at all the workshops because then when I did go to turn a bowl it, I knew much more than I thought that I did and then spent some time with Maddie Whitaker to do some turning and after many conversations with lots of other green woodworkers I got really sucked into turning as my favorite type of green woodwork. Um, still carve a lot of spoons, but I like being on the lathe probably more than anything else within woodworking. So it's become such a big part of my life. Otherwise, um, I'm also a broom maker, you'll see in another video. Broom and brush maker, and I do some other fiber work. I definitely lean into the fact that I thrive in doing many things and I actually feel I do things better when I have a few things to focus on and I think that was my way of learning that my ADHD was just fine and that <laughs> I could live with it and be a multi-potentialite <laughs> so I definitely keep myself busy with a lot of different crafts. So you're currently settled in Sweden is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah and you've traveled extensively throughout Europe teaching and whatnot mm -hmm. what's that been like? Um, well, living in Sweden, we've been there for seven months now, eight months, seven months, uh, and we love it. We've been coming and going for the last few years. We've done uh, artist residency there. We're working on some events there. Uh, we just, we met some people that felt like we found our people, um, almost like we didn't really choose to be there, like we were just kind of meant to go there. Otherwise, traveling around Europe was great. We've had the chance to teach, oh gosh, I don't know in many countries. We used to live in a van full time um, and carried six lathes and seven axe blocks and a forge and anvil and materials for many different crafts with us and would teach as we go. And that was a really great way to like expand the network and community outside of the places that we're from, Germany and the United States and then all the people we know in the UK. So it's been such a gift to do that and move around. And also, just one last thing is you're actually organizing and you, ha you do organize your own festival in Germany. Yes, we Is do. that correct? <laughs> yes. Do you want to briefly talk about that in case people are not familiar? Yeah, definitely. So we're going into our third year of our festival. It's called Fawn Hand Festival, spelled with a V in German that's pronounced Fawn, Fawn Hand. Um, and we've actually moved dates the first two years and again next year we'll be moving dates but uh, it's in now in western Germany this year it's at mid-September and then next year it'll be closer in the summer so that it can be a more family friendly event but it's an international event like this year we have teachers from eight countries or more and participants from more than that it's really it's really wonderful we're really excited and can't believe it's already been three years <laughs> so what I'll do I'll put a link below to that as well the, the Fonhan Festival, all being well, I'll be attending this year for the first time. Uh, looking forward to documenting and spending time with yourselves and the other makers. Um, so I appreciate all of that. It's good to know you as a maker, uh, once again, in case people are not familiar yeah. with you. So moving on to the video at hand. <laughs> so we've got some examples here. Where would you like to start in terms of talking um, through? Anywhere. Uh, you can see I tend to make larger things and small things. <laughs> I'd say that a common size eating bowl is probably the least common thing that I turn. Um, I really like plates and large bowls. Um, 
these are the most two recent pieces that I've actually done in the UK. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say either, I'm, I think it's, for me, it's taken much longer to come to a point where I have some particular style. I really like to explore and play uh, with forms and consistently adapting and altering. Uh, some of that's just in my nature of what I find the most interesting and exciting. But yeah, so here's like a very large beach plate. I've got many different woods here. This is a nest set from California from, this is something that we have in our use every day. So it looks a bit more worn. It's a be very beautiful wood. It's Madrone from California. And yeah, even maybe some of the impractical, <laughs> something with knots and nicks and things in it that, you know, often when you're a producer of things that you want to have a practical use. If you get to this point, most people won't finish the bowl. But then once I do is there's often somebody that particularly wants something that looks like this. So it's a good, it's a good thing, I think, creatively to do what you may not otherwise do. You know, this has branch inclusions and other pieces that, you know, in a workshop, I would advise you to avoid. But in your creative practice, I think it's good to lean into some of those things. And I think it's also an opportune moment to talk about the fact that you and your husband, Oliver, you make and teach full time, don't you? Yes, yes. So we are, we make and sell things. We also teach workshops in Sweden. Like this year we had had and have workshops in Sweden, Germany, um, the UK. And then every time we go back home to the United States, I often have workshops throughout California, parts of Oregon, um, and potentially beyond as well. And people are also welcome to come and stay with us in Sweden because we have the space to now host people at our own workshop. And then again, our festival is a really great place to come and learn. So we teach, we also then make tools and supplies that our students really love to have access to because some things, you know, there's a kind of a barrier to entry is getting tools that you need to do these crafts. And then to the folks that can't come to our workshops, we have things like these videos and other resources that you can get directly from us, which I love having that relationship, even when it's like through Instagram, getting a message, I built a lane. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a lot of our, it's amazing that this is our full-time work. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's beautiful what you guys are up to. Um, in this particular video, is there a certain type of bowl you're hoping to demonstrate? Yeah, I think it'll be more like this, may not be quite as large. I think it can be hard to also tell size. I have very large hands, but um, something somewhat like this, but we're gonna use some ash wood, might make it a little shallower. We'll see what happens. But yeah, it'll be a good size bowl, partially because that's what I love to turn. <laughs> This is from a bit of beach from Northern England. So Raleigh, beginning the process, where would you like to begin? Okay, so beginning the process, you need to have some wood, right? Uh, so here we have some ash that, I'm not actually sure when it was felled, um, but we got a piece from our friend Oscar Rush and this bit here is quite large. Uh, a lot of the time when I'm making a bowl, I am using as much of the wood as I have available to me. So in this case, this could be a very large bowl here. The bowl would sit in half the log. Use a pencil as a bit of a reference. The bowl is going to sit in half the log like this. So if you have this bowl for reference, you can see it can actually be a really deep bowl, but we're not gonna quite do that today. In terms of wood selection, do you have like uh, preferences for the type of wood um, to use? Definitely have some favorites. Uh, the more and more we turned, you know, the first years, it was really nice to start with softer woods, like, or like the softer end of hardwoods. So alder, willow, birch, which we still do enjoy turning, uh, but we kind of approach them a little bit differently. We usually let them settle or dry a little bit longer than we might with the harder end 
spectrum of hardwoods. So we really love beech. <laughs> it's definitely a favorite. Coming from California, I, ha I felt like I had a lot less selection of woods as people here in the UK and Germany. But I think the best thing to do is really just experiment with what you have in your area. There have been some great examples recently, um, like Jeff Hannes has been turning every kind of wood he can possibly find within the UK. And it's been amazing to see what is possible. Um, so if somebody says you need to use you know, these five woods, I encourage you to try other ones. Try what you can actually get your hands on. Uh, and that's a curiosity, back in California, what woods do you use there? So in California, I really like um, maple, which in the UK, some people will call sycamore, um, which is our maple. There's big leaf maple, and then there's also London plain in California. That's also really good. Uh, Madrone, I've had a lot of great success with. Some, it can be a, twisty, warpy wood, but I've really loved it. Um, pear, oh, I forget the kind, specific kind of pear. It's used ornamentally in a lot of spaces. Um, pear is a beautiful buttery wood. A lot of the fruit woods, there's a lot of alder also in certain regions of California on the West Coast. There's a lot of oak, there's ash, but definitely there I would be most excited if I can get maple and madrone and pear. Lovely. Yeah. So coming back to now, the piece we have in front of us, um, what are you going to do? Okay, so, well, I already have a split piece here. And so in this case, with this piece of wood, um, you could make two halves. Uh, you could also try and split it into thirds, and then you could get three smaller eating bowls or something out of it, you know. We're gonna work with one of these halves, take it down a bit. Uh, while I have this, log here. I'm going to flip it over now that I've made those pencil marks. There's some other projects that you can make that aren't just bowls. For example, this locking lid box, which when it comes to a locking lid box, you have to be a bit more specific with your wood selection because we're working with fresh wood. So it still has moisture content in it. It has not been kiln dried. So when you turn a green wood bowl, there's going to be some warping which i don't you can maybe barely see there might be a slight lift on this end grain corner some woods definitely warp much more which i really love i love the warp that shows up on a bowl i think it gives it a lot of character and it's a feature that comes specifically from green woodworking but when it comes to boxes you don't want that warpage to happen. So to bring a box, you need quite big diameter wood. So in this case, a box would come from something like this, where you have, ooh, I need to sharpen my pencil now. Um, you have this grain that is really consistently going through the whole thing. So as it shrinks, it just shrinks this way and doesn't pinch on either side, which is what will happen when you use half a log. But today we're going to use half a log. Hopefully you'll have some other videos on these beautiful things in another, at another time. Okay, so the first place that I start once I have half a log, uh, and even before I split the log in half, I'm going to pay attention to see if there are any knots on the piece of wood that I'm working with. I may initially just try to avoid that, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes there is a branch hidden within the tree from many years back that you won't find until you start turning. <laughs> but in this case, um, I already see these two here. The pith in this tree is actually in the other half of the log, so it's actually popped out of here a little bit. But I am going to come in here and remove this with a fro. We're gonna see what, how it splits off, um, and then we'll go to the next step. Uh, when it comes to splitting, a log. Some axes really don't split very well. Some split better than others. I try to avoid splitting large pieces with my axes that I'm using for carving because it can be pretty hard on the axe, um, you know, hitting the back of the head. The handle can get loose or something like that. A fro is a really great tool and if you don't have a fro, getting some cheap axes, making some wedges out of wood, there are a lot of ways that you can split a log. In this case, I'm going to use this fro and line up more or less with the line that I made. I've got a really big, heavy mallet. Something that I, you know, I would encourage 
what do I want to say? Oh, I'm a woman and have a bit less specific muscle strength than a lot of men doing these crafts. So I will do my best to share things that I find are maybe more ergonomic or beneficial to using tools to your advantage. Using something like this, me doing like lifting this with one hand and dropping it, it's pretty hard on my wrist. So something that I recommend practicing is actually taking a mallet and swinging it up overhead because then it's doing a lot of the work. The momentum has it moved through and then you're not smashing down the mallet to do work. It becomes much more effortless. It's a little thing I definitely teach to anybody that feels like they don't have the strength to do this. And I want to hold the fro down low and close to the blade. This isn't typically like sharp, uh, but you're wanting to keep it down there because if I hold my hand up here and hit this, there's a vibration that goes through the handle and I've actually bruised my palm before if the wood is particularly hard. So you want to hold your hand down here. I'm going to tap slightly to get it to bite a little bit. And then I'll do my, might have to readjust. I want to make sure that I'm going in the same space. If I make, if the fro moves, every time I hit, I'm sending in little cracks and I really want to avoid doing that. Even going up on your toes like I'm doing and coming down. Move it over a little bit. I think there might be a bigger knot in there. We'll see. Okay. There we go. Okay. So this is what we took off. Get these little branches out. Didn't look like they went very deep. Okay. So the next bit. Hmm. Actually, I'm going to use the fro to take a little bit off the back as well. So is that to save on the axe work? Yeah, and also because the axe that I have is one that I really love that I don't want to hit with the hammer. <laughs> but it's good to have just a, just a little bit of um, flatness on the back. So there's there's not a purpose to be taking off material here. It's just a little bit to take off to have a flat surface to work with. I am going to do more after with the axe because when you're splitting off small bits, it's not likely that it's going to go through the whole log. It's going to the piece of wood is going to like wedge itself out because of the tension in the wood. So you see, it splits out like that. But I can flip it over, go to the other side. Huh. Ash typically splits really nicely. Okay. So now I want to flatten both surfaces a bit more. I'll start on the face or the top side of the bowl. And for those that are curious, what axe are you using? This is a Hans Carlson axe. It's, <laughs> it's a bit of a unique one. Um, it actually looked much more gold in color just because they did um, some of their tempering work out of order. And so it was a second of theirs and I thought it was really pretty, but it's starting to lose its color from use and stuff. <laughs> so, I also want to add a bit, if, if you haven't done axe work before, and also if you're like, how do I even start with this piece? This is an axe block, very basic name for it. Uh, I find for both spoon carving and for um, bowl turning, a piece with a shoulder like this is really helpful because I can lean the piece of wood on there and I don't have to support it with my other hand as much. This, these, I also recommend it having only three legs. It's much easier for it to balance. And I typically, for me, what I have is I have it below, 
I don't want it up at elbow height. I definitely want it at a lower swing because I get more power. If it's much lower than that, it's gonna feel too low and I'm gonna start bending over. But between myself and my husband, he's, oh, he's a good seven inches more taller than me. And so we use a lot of the same things, lathe and ax blocks, and you just kind of adjust a little bit with your body. So don't worry too much about that. With the movement of the ax, for bowls, I tend to be holding the ax from the middle of the handle down to the end. Not so much up here, but every, if I want to be more specific or dainty with my work, I'll hold my hand up, choke it up right under the beard of the ax. But mostly I'm gonna be here. And most of the work I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be working straight up and down in line with my body. I don't wanna be axing at an angle. One, it's not very ergonomic, it's not very comfortable, and it's also less safe. So I'm going to be focusing on working in the middle of the ax block. This is a good thing to practice. If you haven't done much axing, let their, you know, swing your ax, more or less try to aim for the same spot. That does come with time. There's quite a bit of muscle memory that happens. Something that I, it didn't feel intuitive when I started axing is you actually want a relaxed wrist that so much power comes from this flick of your wrist wrist <laughs> uh, something that I was taught though I don't have experience is someone was referring to like fly fishing and how that last flick of your wrist gives something a lot more power like you're following through in action so this is going to be much more um, efficient and easier on your body. If I'm having a really stiff wrist, one thing I'm doing is I'm squeezing really hard with my hand and I don't wanna do that. And it becomes, the vibration comes up through your arm. When I'm holding with my hand, it's mostly just these back fingers that are doing work and these are just kind of supporting. So my, my thumb and my pointer finger aren't really like tense around the handle. And that comes with practice, but it helps with accuracy and power to have a loose wrist. So definitely recommend doing that because axing on a bowl blank is quite a bit of work. Okay, so here, if you see in this direction, this is pretty flat, hill, and then flat. So I just wanna get rid of this middle section. A lot of times trees are quite twisted as they're following the sun throughout the year. They kind of rotate and sp spiral around. So what you'll usually have are like two low corners and two high corners, which is interesting that I'm realizing now that it's always the same corners, which means they're probably all rotating the same way. Ah! <laughs> so I'm gonna remove this middle bit and I'm not, I don't wanna start up here because I've already split the log here and this keeps, it was elevated before I split the log. So if I try and split that off, it might just pop out again and not actually take away the shape. So I'm gonna come down here. I have my thumb tucked back as much as I can, leaning against this bit of my ax block. And I'm just going to do some stop cuts three quarters of the way up to kind of relieve the tension here. It'll help take off that, straighten it out a bit. So you can see it is kind of, it pops out there. So I'm gonna be aware of that as I keep going and adjust my axing a little bit to take off less at a time, but it's kind of unavoidable and I'll, we'll, we'll take care of that once on the lathe. I'm not too worried about it. nature of this piece of wood is a little funky there. I can, you know, something I love about green woodwork is that I'm in a consistent relationship with the material that I'm using. The way the ax responds to the wood, you start to get a feel for the way the grain is moving through this particular piece of wood. Like if the ax is getting stuck or it's not really chipping off, uh, I'm consistently taking in some kind of information. 
That's why I also encourage you to work with different kinds of wood. With another piece of wood, I may have not flipped that, but I can tell that it's not coming off very easily. Okay. That's enough. I mostly just want right here in the middle to be flat because once I put my mandrel in, I don't want it to be wobbling. There's definitely a little more I could do here, but with experience, I've found that I tend to like to do more turning than axing. I enjoy axing, but I actually feel that the lathe is more efficient with little bits and pieces like that. And also while we're here, I'll do a little bit of the same on the back. use the chainsaw to cut this from a larger trunk of the tree. We made sure to, we, we check the diameter of the log first. So let's see, my fingers are about, it doesn't, it doesn't have to know the distance. I, this is about 10 inches. So my fingers are about eight, maybe it's nine inches or so. And I take usually my hand, sometimes a ruler. I'm gonna take the diameter and then I'm going to go into the length and if anything, you want to cut your piece a little shorter than the diameter. That's if you're wanting to take as much advantage of the size of log that you have. If you want to make a certain size bowl, then you'll do it based on that. So I want to take a little bit of a shorter cut because axing off the end grain is the hardest bit. And so when you leave extra length outside of your bowl, it's the hardest part to get rid of. It's much easier to take off the sides and make it a little narrower. So now I have a compass here, compass dividers of any kind works. And I'm going to find center. There's a few different ways to find center. So you're taking it right to the edge? Yeah. Really, I actually thought of this the other day. I could find center this way by taking one point, drawing a line taking another point and then right in the middle of that should be center. That's the first time I've actually done that on a bowl blank, but my math mind was like, why did I never do that before? <laughs> it's so much faster. This particular compass has a pencil in it, but you can use one that just has a metal point and scribes, but it's good for camera. You can see it probably much better. So in this case, I'm not worried about these side bits that'll come off really easily in the axing. If you did want to make a handled bowl, you would want this, the end grain. The end grain is where you've cut through the wood. You'd want that to be longer because on this place, it's quite fragile. And if you had handles here, they could snap off really easily. So that is a case in which you would cut a blank longer than it might be in diameter. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is split off these sides. I don't need them. I am going to place my ax, you know, just outside of this circle. It's a bit of an estimate. Some people would be very safe and come out here. I, you know, I live on the edge a little bit. <laughs> but ash also typically splits very true. So a lot of my decisions about how I do something also comes with knowledge of certain woods that I'm working with. But let's see, let's see what happens. <sighs> ah, it's fine. Okay, now the other side. Also on ash, it's pretty easy to see each ring so I can line it up with the ring that I want. Nice. There's some beautiful coloring in this ash as well. Okay. So when you're first starting bowl turning or almost any kind of carving that you are axing out, it can be really disorienting and really challenging that you can see the circle on this side 
but you can't see anything on this side. And I understand like some people want to take the compass and draw a circle on this side, but the likelihood of that really being lined up with the other side isn't uh, that great. But an alternative, sometimes what I do, especially for some students, you know, a lot of people work visually. So I'll, you know, I'm guesstimating this as somewhat of a cross. And then I'll do the same. I'll come around the ends, the sides. With experience, I, I don't do this almost ever, but I think it can be totally understandable if you want to do this. I'm just meeting up the lines. So in some way, this is more or less the center on my, the back of my bowl. And it can be helpful depending on the shape of wood that you have, because if I just look at this from the top down, I don't know that I'd guess that that was the center. So it can be very helpful. I'm going to sit here and just give you some visual lines of where I'm going to start my axing. Okay, I'm going to take off each of these corners first. I really encourage you to stick with somewhat of a, uh, like use a method in your axing. As you're starting, it feels quite frustrating if it's difficult to do, um, and the temptation is to kind of constantly move and rotate the piece that you're axing. Same thing with spoon carving. It's much harder to create a round shape when you're moving it around. It's actually easier to make a circle from a square than it is a circle from an amorphous blob kind of thing. And it just happens without thinking about it. So right now I'm gonna start with this corner closest to me. Um, the bark is gonna come off as I go. I'm not worried about that. And I'm leaning it up against the shoulder on my ax block. I, I don't always work with one of my legs in a stance. If anything, the most important thing I find is to have flexibility in your knees because if you were to miss the ax block, if you're really rigid in your body, then you're not going to move with the momentum of your body. But if I have bounce in my knees, one, it'll be a bit more efficient with the weight of my body kind of falling with every swing of the ax. But also if something else happens, my body's gonna follow the momentum. The more stiff you are, generally the less safe it is with a sharp tool. So are you working towards the outer part of the circle on the other side? Yes. So I'm going to ax this down, you know, close to the corner. I'm going to see how it goes. Uh, working across this whole section. This is a quite large section, but also ash axes quite nicely. But this is where the shoulder is really helpful. I'm adjusting the bowl so that one, I'm working closer to the center of my ax block, but also so that my ax is working in a, is this perpendicular? <laughs> it is, yeah. I always, in this, in this line, because if I'm down here and I'm needing to rotate my ax some way, like I said earlier, it's not as efficient, uh, not as comfortable. I've been a fiend for learning how to do clean axing and I'm consistently amazed <laughs> with how I've gotten there because I just definitely learning and admiring people like um, Anna Casserly and Beth Moe and women that are uh, really good with axes. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna do the next corner. And remember like you're constantly moving your piece and you can move your body around the ax block. If it feels awkward, there might be another way to do it. So, you know, give yourself the space to think of how can I change my position? So 
something that I think helps with uh, efficient and clean axing is that I'm there's a slight slicing motion. It's very subtle because I don't obviously want to swing off the block. But as I come in, I'm leading with the bottom part of my axe for power. So down here closer to the beard. If I'm doing more dainty work, I'm working closer to the top like such. But there's a slight slicing action with each cut that I make. So now you can look at that, kind of see if they're more or less even. Looks pretty good. And I'll do the other side. So now we have all four corners off. And next, I want to bring down these two corners. We're going to wait on these bits with the bark. It's a good reminder with actually keeping the bark on. You can see the side bits of the tree. This is going to have to be axed slightly differently or just with a different awareness. So here we're going to take off these corners, the end grain, which it's harder to ax because if you think of the whole tree as like a bundle of straws, this ends up feeling very tight. And if you were to try and chop all of the straws in half or at an angle, it's going to be much harder to slice through where if you could stick a knife through the straws here, it'll go much easier. So we're going to take off these corners. Eh, you know, I'll take it. Let's say something like that is going to be my aim. I'm going to try and ax something like from up here, maybe a little bit further in not so steep to there. So those, that's the bit I'm going to take off on both ends. If you're watching this <laughs> and you're thinking, ah, oh, it looks easy or, oh my God, she's making that look easy. Like give yourself some space and uh, generosity. This was so hard for me. Axing, I was scared. I was nervous. It took me hours to ax out a bowl and now it takes me less than 20 minutes or less, I don't know. Depends on the size. Definitely not there yet. It might be a bit too steep here, so I might move my mark back a little bit. Also, before I move on, if you've created a really wide surface like this, it's much harder to ax something that's wide. That's almost, almost wider than my ax. Down there it definitely is. So you can break that up into new corners. You can do this corner, this corner again, and then you'll have another little ridge here that will make it a little bit easier. So now I've reached the line on that side. perfect. I'm not so worried about that as I also do the other side and come back round. Right now I'm kind of thinking this is going to be a pretty deep bowl. When you have the blank of wood it always looks smaller <laughs> than once you've axed it out or gotten it on the lathe, at least to me. And also to most students I found that they're like, oh I don't want it to be that small. And then you ax it and it's much deeper and bigger than you think it is. We're not aiming for perfection with axing. 
just aiming to get the bulk of the material off. Okay, I'm gonna do the other side and then these sides. I'm kind of going off of that distance there. Remember this isn't exact center, but it'll be centered on the lathe later and you'll actually find out <laughs> where center is. Okay, so I've done these. I'm still gonna adjust them a little bit. I'm kind of looking at the angles, just like I did when I first did the corners. I'm seeing if they're close to even. There's a little bit here I still wanna take off, but I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But now I wanna get the sides here where the bark are to kind of match these angles. Now I need, I wanna hit this intentionally. <laughs> A lot of it you want to hit intentionally, but I don't want to take the axe and go straight into the wood like this because then all the grain fibers, like I said, that are kind of like a bunch of little straws. If I go in there, it could send a crack into the bowl that would have my bowl split later. So in this case, if I come off at a shallower angle, then I'll kind of shave off bits, more in line with the rings and how they're moving through. So you can kind of see that as a reference here. You can see this will be the easiest part to ax. Only it was all so, so easy. Take it down a little bit more. Okay, we'll do a few adjustments as we go. You know, right now I'm going through the basic steps of axing a bowl blank. With more experience, you might have a particular shape that you wanna create, in which case you would actually take that into consideration while you're axing so that you have less work to do on the lathe. Uh, maybe you have a certain thickness of like rim or design that you wanna keep in place or depending on the shape of your bowl, you'd wanna ax in consideration of that. You can see how these are coming off in bits like this, that this, from this angle into the grain, it splits off much easier. So that's why you're wanting to be careful. more or less the same on either side. Okay, so now we've created this square, so I actually need to come back and take these corners down again. I'm gonna more or less make an octagon uh, and then take off the corners from the other side, or these corners here, sorry. I'm putting my hair up, it's very warm. <laughs> okay, so it's like back to step number one. You can start to see why it's important. I have kind of two examples here of what your bowl might look like. This is usually what mine look like now today where you can kind of see these very clear facets. On this side where I showed that you could take off two corners and split the difference, it starts to look a bit more round, but it's much harder to track that shape because it's not very specific than it is for me on this side. I can just take off each corner. Um, depending on your wood, before I keep going, something you want to be aware of is as I'm getting down to a thinner lip around here, it is possible that I get down to a little bit closer to the corner and then actually a chunk of wood chips off of there. So I'm getting, my swings are getting a little bit lighter 
to try and prevent that from happening. There's a few other things that you can do that I'll mention at a further step. You can see we have oh that's not is that an octa yeah it is an octagon <laughs> now we have an octagon here eight sides corner 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 and then these other bits that we took off now I could come back and take off each of those corners I may or may not do usually these days I probably wouldn't because I feel fine on the lathe to even that all out um, but that is something that you can come around and do but more importantly now you want to get rid of these corners. So you can continue working from the back or the side. Something that I do sometimes, uh, sometimes it's depending on the wood. It would also depend on if I, if I want a really wide rim, I can show you with, like with this box, this is a really wide rim. And to be, when this was in, a blank form before it was turned, that's really challenging to axe, especially around these corners because you have a lot of end grain. So similar to what I showed um, on the other side where you can, instead of doing just a flat face here of axing, let me give you a visual, of axing specifically like this, so I'm in line with the side, I'm creating that curve, I can make one corner and like break it down into corners. So if a certain face is feeling really challenging for you to ax, still keep a system of breaking it down from one corner to another corner, and then you'll have created some new ones. So that you're always coming back down to the face that you're landing on. I was once told by a elder that his mom said, you never cut corners except in woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I might come around here and with that example, I'm going to be a little bit more dainty to follow my line. I'm going to take it down a little bit from the, the front side. This is also a way, like I had just said, that when I then come from the, the back, it's less likely to chip off some of the front here, which I think is more likely with ash than it might be with some other woods because it has a more open grain structure and splits so easily. So now I've created this corner here and then I can come and that's much easier to take off than when that was really wide. But here, let's do that on some of the other corners. And this is where I'm holding the ax a little higher up to be a bit more dainty. That's what Anna says, you're dainty axing. If I were to cross over the line, that's not a huge issue. <laughs> like. The most important parts are you want your center point visible. You don't want to get rid of that. I mean, it would suck because your lowest point is always going to be kind of the furthest in that you've axed. Same thing on the back. But if you cross the line, there's likely still a bowl in there. So don't stress about that too much. So now we have kind of this funny shape, but I've made this a little bit easier to ax here. 
Again, it's just one option. I, I do it a lot of the time. I don't do it every time. Kind of depends. So it does get a little harder to work with the more you ax because now it's more of a wobbly form. So getting it to be stable as you're axing, how to grip it naturally becomes more challenging. Something that you can do if we swap sides is use your shoulder here and put the corner that you're axing up on the shoulder. You can see I'm, I'm slightly axing not in line or not straight up and down. But what I do to kind of compensate with that, because I was saying how that was the most ergonomic, the most safe, is I actually, I tilt my whole upper body to be in line. It's good for a sight line. And then the power is still like coming from my center. done any spoon carving there's some similar axe maneuvers you can see the end grain is much harder because on other parts of the blank my axe almost just seamlessly goes through it but I'd call that good enough I'm gonna turn that off anyways okay on to the next one Now we're on the last corner and it's kind of the trickiest bit because now the whole thing is round and so it'll take a bit more adjustment because even with putting it up here on the shoulder each time I hit it as you can see it's rotating so I kind of have to adjust it every few blows which is normal I'm countering that twist a little bit by putting some extra pressure on this side with my hand to try and keep it in place. Okay, just, this is almost just being anal, it's not really necessary. <laughs> so the last thing I might do, as you can see here, is around the edge, I've kind of got these little scallops going all the way around. So this is a reason you might come and take down each corner just to make your rim around here a bit more even. And that just makes it a little bit easier on the lathe. Generally, that'll be up to you with time and practice if you want to do that or not. But for the sake of also showing what it'll look like is I'll just come around to each corner. I'm really not trying to take off much wood. I'm just taking off this scallop a little bit. Again, not going for perfection. But is it a case, just like in spoon carving, that the more you do with the yaks, um, the less work you're creating for yourself in the next phase? <clears throat> I actually, so with spoon carving, I am a strong advocate of almost over axing just to, you can get really far with an ax in spoon carving. And if you go too far, you've made some fancy firewood, you can make another one. If you're very limited on wood, I wouldn't suggest that. But in this case, I've found that I tend to do less axing because I can be more efficient on there. The, you know, I wanna get rid of the bulk of it, but having it be as round as possible, you'll spend a lot more time trying to create a round shape uh, than on the lathe where it will create a round shape for you. So I actually, in a way, it's kind of opposite <laughs> to spoon carving. But that's, that's really come with time. Okay, so 
Again, it's not perfect. There's still some highs and lows, but we'll take care of that. It's much less extreme than the scallops that were here before. And I can even see, if I were to really look at this and say, you know, where could I change? One, I'm not sure that that is exact center. So I'm making a judgment based off of a point that might already be wrong itself. I can see that maybe a little bit can come off there or there. I don't think it's worth the time. It's worth getting it on the lathe and turning. Yeah, there's our blank. Maybe this is the more important side, the axed side. Be some beautiful color in there. Okay, so the next bit, and often people's questions, if they've come up and they haven't, um, like when we've done a demo or something and they haven't seen us actively turning, they're like, how does this go on that? And what we need is a mandrel, commonly called a mandrel. If this was a large machine, it would be a drive shaft. So there's two different versions, or two main versions. One is a tenon mandrel, which I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna use this one today. Um, and then the other one is a spike mandrel. A spike mandrel can look all sorts of ways. These are, you know, part experiment, part operational mandrels for us. Um, these bits in particular, we have forged. Uh, we make mandrels if this is a project that you haven't learned how to do yet. Uh, it's a little bit different to make a mandrel than it is to turn a bowl, but a similar application. But if you just want to jump on the lathe, we have mandrels available for our students and other folks. So with the spike mandrel, you know, maybe you'll do a whole mandrel video at some point of different ways that you can make them. But today we're going to use the tenon mandrel. I just wanted to show these as an example. I find that these are most useful, could be very useful for this. It's a sizable bowl, but it's really good for things like plates and stuff with a very large diameter because the torque has a higher potential that the mandrel rotates within the piece of wood. And when you have spikes, it can't rotate anywhere. So in this case, I'm going to use an auger and bit to drill a hole. Uh, we often also use a Makita drill with a Forstner bit or something like that to drill a hole. Um, either one is an option. These are pretty easy to find in a lot of uh, secondhand vintage shops. And I want my bit to just be slightly larger than the tenon on my mandrel. I don't know the exact measurements of this. Um, the tenon can sometimes change with use or weather if it's wet or dry, depending on the season. So often what we do is we drill a test hole into a piece of wood, hammer it in, see if it's wedged in there well, um, and then that should be good. do this between my knees, kind of squeezing it between my legs. This is why it's important to have right when I scribed the circle, I made sure that I left an indent with my compass so that I can put the lead screw right into that hole because that's going to be the center. It's what all my axing has been based off of. So I'm going to gently screw it in there until it's in and starts cutting. Typically what I'll do is a few rotations and I'm, I'm siding from the top, but since I don't have someone else helping me line it up, if you rotate it every few rounds, you'll usually end up pretty true straight up and down. And how far deep are you going? Yeah, so here, let's pull it out and see where we're at. So let me grab my mandrel. Something that you want to do, you can test it, is, you know, get the bits out. And then you can take a stick and I can put this in there when it hits the bottom, measure it with my finger, my nail, and I can line it up with that. And you can see I have a little bit further to go. I don't want it, I want it to be as deep as the tenon or a little bit deeper. I don't want it to be shallow 
because then there's a tendency for them to wobble. or whatever you have, it's often a shaving. Okay, so that's good enough. So it's a little bit deeper. I'm gonna hammer this in. Um, some things I do, <laughs> I don't know that they're necessary. It often depends on the wood, it depends on the mandrel, but if your mandrel, mandrel was turned green, then your tenon might be slightly oval. If you want, if you, depending on the size of your bit, and the size of your tenon. If you feel like you need a little bit extra tension in there, then I will put it across the grain. So on the mandrel here, the grain is going this way and the bowl is going that way. Sometimes I'll do that so that the oval uh, shape is pushing sideways. It may or may not really matter, but if you're feeling like the size is almost too close, that's a little thing you can add. So now I'm going to hammer it in. I also might rotate to kind of keep it straight. You can hear how the sound changed in those hammers that I know it's all the way in the way that it echoes. And it's quite flush there. There's just a little gap there. I'm not worried about that. This is why you want this face right around the center of your bowl to be flat so that these sit as flush as possible. But that to me looks pretty good. We're ready to put it on the lathe. Okay, so here we are at the lathe itself. So we can do a little lathe tour, lathe anatomy to start. Um, I'm going to say it as I have either learned or we call it. They're not all universal um, names, and some of them I don't know why it's called that. <laughs> so starting from the most central point, this is the lathe bed. Um, we Here we've used the bed and the poppets. These are both poppets, are um, from Alder, and they've actually just been sawn from round wood uh, that we had a lot of access to, um, and recently, this is one of 14 that we built in a week long workshop that we offer where you can come and build a lathe and even learn how to turn a bowl, make your own tools. Uh, it's long form workshops are definitely our favorite to do and often participants favorites because of how we get to connect and learn so much in such a short time relatively. So here is the lathe bed. These are the poppets and it's between the poppets that we're going to mount our bowl between these two center points. And these two center points are forged and ground. Also something that um, it's kind of like the mandrel and the centers and of course the lathe, but it's all these little bits that I find to be the um, kind of the barrier to actually start turning. The tools, they're kind of, they feel like pieces that if you haven't turned yet, they're kind of the hardest to get a hold of. So those are things that we offer to help you actually get into turning. So centers, center points, poppets, lathe bed, again, legs, maybe the most obvious. Um, in the poppets, there's two wedges that have been made and they're slightly rounded on the side. They wear down like when there's a rounded shape or a chamfer or something, it will last longer and they fit well because they're also rounded in here because the drill bit that came in here is also round. So it matches with that and then wedges in and holds them in place. When we put this poppet in, we anchor it in there so it doesn't move generally at all. And for, for lathe bed, something that you would, we would cover on a full week course there doesn't have to be very specific dimensions. This uh, channel here in the middle is also quite wide. You know, this would allow me to turn a bowl 
with a mandrel that's very deep and then it could be basically twice the height of this. So you could turn something really large. That's what your proportions are more based off of. Most people have lathes that can turn things that they never turn. <laughs> so you can actually have a much smaller slot, you can have shorter poppets. Um, that's kind of how it all relates to each other. Um, here we have our uprights on either side. Uh, now this is a version of a pole lathe that is mobile. Traditionally, it was, you, it was a spring pole lathe, so you'd be using a sapling um, that would even potentially just be living in the wood for the resistance that your rope string um, is around. In this case, we're using bungee, and so the bungee is sitting between the uprights. If you had a spring pole, you wouldn't need the uprights because you would just have a sapling there. Now, we have a cross beam between our uprights and that's to prevent these from bending in. I think it makes a really big difference in the power that you're able to get from the machine itself to prevent these from arcing in too much. Um, of course you can adjust that with more bungee but you want to find a balance of tension between all the bits. Okay on this side we have a tool rest here and this piece um, we have uh, Oliver has lovingly named the flute because it has a bunch of holes in it and looks like a flute. Some other people say the tool rest support or something. I think a flute is a great name. <laughs> uh, and down here we have the pedal, which it's nice to have the pedal a little bit elevated if you can see back here. Um, it can also just be anchored straight into the ground, um, but it gives you a, a larger stride of movement when it's just supported by something. If you've looked at some other lathes before, you'll notice that my pedal isn't fixed. So it's not attached to the side of my lathe. Um, when you're starting, it definitely feels easier to have it fixed, but I actually swap legs, which is very uncommon. <laughs> but I like to be able to swing um, my pedal and move it around so that I can adjust my body a little bit more. And that also helps with the shape of bowls. I find not having it fixed is a better option in the long run and you get used to it pretty fast. It feels like you're surfing or something at first, but once you get used to it, it's pretty easy. Down here, I just have a block of wood that I'm going to be standing on. Again, once I'm set up, you'll see it allows me a longer stride, so I'm also not slapping the ground every time I pedal uh, and gives more rotations possible. The lathe itself, I think I said with the axe block, the difference in height between myself and my husband is quite significant. And we often work on the same lathes. And sometimes he'll stand on a higher block and I'll stand on a shorter one, even though I'm much shorter than him. So you tend to get used to what you're comfortable with or you get comfortable with what you're using. So I wouldn't stress about it too much. Um, you know, the centers, if I'm off the block, everything is kind of about chest level. If I'm up here, it's more at like waist level. So I can adjust the height of my block. There's a little, a lot of little micro adjustments that you can make. So don't stress too much about specific proportions. Yeah? Yeah. Lastly, would I be right in saying that the laves are typically built from a much harder, denser wood? Yes. So. When I first started turning and I was, we were making our first batch of lathes because we've built maybe, we've definitely built more than 30, maybe even up to 40 lathes in the last six years. Um, I think closer to 40 between the two of us. Um, and when I first started, I was quite stressed about making sure that I had a very hard wood like ash or oak for the lathe bed. And with some very sound advice, <laughs> Use what you have. Use what you have access to. You can get three by three boards at the hardware store and screw them together. Use lumber that you can get a hold of. This is alder, which is probably our, like some of our most lightweight lathes. One, they're really nice to be able to move around because they're so light and we're carrying them in a vehicle. So it keeps things lighter all around and it's not super hard, um, but it's because it's what we had access to and it was free for us. So 
don't stress too much about that. When I was told, you know, just use what you have, you can always add weights to it if you actually want it to be heavier. The biggest thing with weight is you're trying to prevent it from like moving too much. But in this case, with a round bowl, there's not gonna be a huge amount of movement on my lathe. It's very stable. Yeah, does that answer that question? It does, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, so tools. You know, so we've already used an ax, an auger, a mallet, a fro. We've gone through a good handful of tools. Some, some of those you may have never heard of. Um, some you may be very familiar with. So now once we get onto the lathe, we have hook tools. They look like little hooks. That's why they're called hook tools. <laughs> the common name for them, turning hooks, uh, but specifically these are, they're made and intended for a pole lathe, or some folks are using some on some electric lathes, but without that experience myself, I'm not going to speak to that. Uh, so they do look like little hooks. They're mostly only sharp, and you're doing so much work with just this amount of tool. Can you see it? Okay. So it really only needs to be sharp from about there to the tip. And there's two main tools that you use when turning a bowl. And the only difference is that if I put the tips to the sky on both of them is that the cutting edge is on the opposite side. So commonly, like a lot of the world, the names for them is going to be referred to for someone who is right-handed. So for a right-handed person, this will be considered a tip up and this is a tip down. So that is in reference right now with the working, my bowl is going to be on the left hand side. So if the tools are on the right side of my bowl, the tip up with the blade facing the bowl is the one with the tip up and the blade facing the bowl with the tip down is the tip down. If you're left handed, it would be the other way around. Um, Personally, with students, we've had people that are left-handed work on a left-handed lathe, which really, to be a left-handed lathe, you just have the mirror opposite. So your poppets are opposite, and instead of working from right to left, you work from left to right. It's good to know if you would like to work that way. Um, some left-handed people just don't do that because it's it's tricky for both hands regardless when you're working on this uh, but it's yeah I've now repeated that twice that it's good to know if you're ordering hooks so we make these hooks in the final form we also teach workshops on how to forge your own hooks and then following this video there's going to be a video explaining the basic process of forging your own hooks but if you're going to order them know that it's based on a right-handed orientation because you technically can turn an entire bowl with just one hook, depending on the shape, because there is some variety. So these are some of our hooks, uh, but just to show a contrast, if you can see the difference in shape of that hook, they're both just as usable. Here's another one. It's much bigger, also just as usable, but the, the ultimate, um, like profile of the hook shape will kind of determine the limits of what you can use that hook for. And with time, I've definitely been learning a lot that a slightly tweaked hook can help when you're adding design elements or different parts of the bowl. It gives you some more flexibility. It might be a little bit more challenging, but learning to forge your own hooks or getting specific hooks in a specific shape uh, adds to the possibilities of what you do on your lathe. Just for also a contrast, if you're doing something like turning boxes or cups, um, you're gonna need a slightly different hook. So we showed this earlier. This was made by Oliver. Uh, it has a locking mechanism. So it has a channel in here and it comes in here, rotates and the lid is set on there. So you need a different set of hooks to reach different parts of the material as you're turning. And so these are specific, more specially made than also if you were to do nesting or cup turning, then you would need specific hooks. And these also you sell? We also you... sell specific turning hooks. So these are for boxes and then there's some for cups and that's something we're definitely always expanding. So keep, keep track of that and awareness. Um, 
if you want to follow along for the hooks that we create. But you can get these from us. Uh, sometimes we do them, we'll make a batch and they'll be available. We also are just able to make them made to order. Okay. So now we need to mount this between our center points. So on one end of the mandrel, we already have center. So I already know where that is, and that is lined up with the center of my bowl. Hopefully it's gone in there straight. If it hasn't, you'll find out as you start turning. <laughs> so I'm going to place this end in, and then I'm going to support it here so I can move a little easier. I'll take this off. So this poppet is driven in there. It's not moving at all, and that's how you want to keep it the whole time. So. I'm going to put that in and then I'm going to move this one in and I'm going, I'm basically guessing where center is. Uh, you start to get to know the feel in the weight of the bowl and finding center. So let's see what I do. Sometimes it's spot on, sometimes it's not. It's pretty close. So I'm giving it a spin. I'm putting in pressure here because if I don't put pressure here, nothing is keeping this in place, so it's gonna fall off. So I'm keeping pressure with my right hand here, giving it a spin. You can see the mandrel slightly bobbing up and down. So I like to take it to the lowest point, and I'm kind of guessing, lowest point, and then I'm gonna just slightly take this and move it Move the point down and lift the bowl just slightly. Really what you're doing, so I haven't moved it yet, is the difference between this high point and this low point, you only need to move it half of that. So you're not making big movements typically. I'm just gonna move it down a little bit, get it in there so I can hold it. It's pretty darn straight. I would call that good enough. This is also something that can feel, I mean, there's a slight wobble. Do I want to, it almost doesn't feel worth it because once it's, once it's centered, almost wherever the wobble is, your bowl will still be centered if it stays there. If it's really far off center, then it's not in line with the initial scribe that you made on the face of your bowl. So you're going to have to be removing a lot more material. So if that's happening to you, then your mandrel isn't very centered. But even once I drive this in, it's going to still slightly move. So I'm holding this tight and hammering it in just to make the point on the base here clear. Because if you've moved it around a lot, then you might have a lot of little dots and you don't know where the actual center point is that you landed on. So you wanna put a mark in there, take it off. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna turn is the base of the bowl. And so I'm turning from right to left as someone who's right-handed. So I'm going to have the base of the bowl still facing this side. Now, what I do, we have a, a bit of paracord here. I, I've learned that there are many grades of paracord <laughs> and I don't actually know them well enough so there's been times that we've bought paracord and it's lasted us a week we've had this for more than two years and this same string and it hasn't broken so there's different levels of paracord some of them because of the friction and stuff break really easily and ours has been based on luck and unluckiness because i should i feel like i should just know <laughs> the grades so that i actually have a reliable source um, i pull the pedal up and hold it between my legs so that everything's loose and I'm not having to hold that weight. With paracord, I tend to put around multiple wraps. Could be three, could be five. Some of that is dependent. If the bowl is really heavy, I do more. Um, some people use a thicker bit of, um, similar to conveyor belt, uh, which they usually just do one wrap around. But this has always worked for us, so I've never, replaced it. Okay, I'm going to wiggle this in there. Again, it's not tight, so I need to keep inward tension so that it doesn't bounce off. And then I'm going to tap in my wedge a bit. I'm not tapping it in 100% yet because I want to make sure this isn't wiggling too much, and it's not. It's very stable. So now I can 
give it some bigger wax. If it's still a little bit away from your bowl, you might have to tap it here. But don't be afraid to drive that in really tight. Uh, sometimes before, after, during, I might put a little wee bit of oil. It's just to help it move a little bit smoother. Um, sometimes I don't really do it in, unless it's squeaking or something, but a little lubrication can help. Is there a particular oil that you're using? No. I mean, this one I think is a tool oil, but it's more whatever oil was closest to the container when it was empty. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anything can be used. So now, before I get started, there's all sorts of little things in the first, um, particularly at the beginning, but also as I'm going, I'm adjusting. I can adjust the swing of this arm to get closer and further here from the bowl. Kind of the main thing that I focus on is I want my fingers to be able to pass through here comfortably. So I have lots of holes in this flute and I can adjust it at any point. And by adjusting it, uh, certain tricky bits, um, it can give you extra room for the movement of your tool. So know if something feels extra challenging, maybe you have to move this in or out. Um, also the height of my pedal here. I, I really don't like it when it's slapping the ground. Right now it really helps because I'm on quite a tall block. I might move to a shorter one afterwards. We'll kind of see how it's going. It's not my usual block. Uh, so I'm gonna see how this feels. So this is where I was saying our pedal isn't fixed to the side. So when you first get on a lathe like this, where it's not fixed, it often feels like you're surfing all over the place. And I used to be a professional, semi-professional dancer at one point, doing partner dancing and Latin dances. Is, is that going to be video part three? Oh yeah, exactly. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do some salsa and bachata while, <laughs> while turning and doing woodwork. Um, but I say that because if you've done any kind of partner dancing, it sounds irrelevant, but, or if you've done any kind of dancing, movement at all, you're going to know everybody's always talking about your core. They're talking about your core. When you're standing here, having relaxedness in both of your knees, my core is engaged, it's much easier to bounce one leg and not have anything else moving up here. To have the focus be the energy is coming from here out. And the same when I'm holding a tool, if you've done partner dancing, I think of having a frame if you're dancing with somebody that I have this movement and this control, uh, control and it's, it's secure, I'm very sturdy on top. And having those kinds of awareness that your body is really an extension of this whole machine, um, something to pay attention to. So when you get on the lathe, if it's totally unfamiliar, just spend some time treadling. Feel what that feels like. Something I might adjust is I might move my line over slightly, okay? I might decide that I want more or less tension up here. Maybe it's depending on the size of the bowl or how tired I am that day. You don't want it to be too hard, but I, I find if it's too light, then you're doing many more strides. Um, and you are, have less uh, power to be removing material. So I want, the, I want the pedal to come up on its own. So it's lifting my leg back up. So, even though there's so much more that goes into bowl turning, if you've ever carved a spoon, I think bowl turning is much easier than spoon carving. I think it's much easier to get good or getting nice bowls off of a lathe than it is to get a really nice ergonomic smooth spoon. Um, and it all feels quite complicated because you're trying to understand your own physical movement, you're giving power 
to the whole machine, the tool application, and even if you understand one part of it when you add the next, I was saying it kind of feels like riding a bike and knitting at the same time. <laughs> You're doing multiple things all at the same time. And that's video number four? Yes, riding a bike and knitting. <laughs> at the same time. Uh, so once you get the application of the tool, you're gonna understand that bit. And once it really like locks in, it's the same thing over the whole bowl. There's like basically two ways to approach the bowl with the tool that you have. Once you get that, you should understand how to grab almost any tool at any part of the bowl and know how to position it in order for the tool to work. The tricky part is then having the stability in your body to hold it in that position because you might get into position and then you add power and then this wants to move your tool. Know that that's totally normal uh, and yeah, once you focus on application with some time, it should all just click into place, I hope. So Whenever it, I say just, I know it's <laughs> not necessarily true. So is this tip up or tip down? So right now I have the tip up. At this time, you can use either one, it doesn't matter. I find that whatever a student starts with, the second tool they use, they always think is easier. It's not really based on the tip up or the tip down, it's just that they've actually started to get used to the tool <laughs> and to the machine. And they're like, oh, why didn't you give this one to me first? It's easier than the other one. So let's talk about tool application. You know, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to grab a finished bowl because visualizing on an uneven surface is a bit tricky. So this is what we're, we're aiming for. A bowl facing its sideways and we're aiming to get rid of all of these ridges or the most of them. Sometimes there might be a little bit left and I kind of like it aesthetically. It shows a bit of the hand work that went into it. So this is what we're going for. And I'm wanting to apply the tool in a way that is going to slice through the wood. Now, in any workshop that I teach, of all the workshops, I feel like there needs to be quite a bit of repetition in hearing how to do turning, how to apply the tool, how to approach different parts. So if I repeat myself, that will be why. So, as you can see, this tool is coming in here more or less at this angle. I don't want to be at this angle because that would be like, if you zoom out a little bit, that would be like scraping the wood here on. And you can see that that doesn't make a nice cut. It makes these little chips, it doesn't sound nice. But if I come at an angle, you're gonna get spirals and shavings. So you're wanting to slice through the wood and every so often you will use a scraping cut. So those are kind of the two applications of a tool. A scraping cut is when it, the cutting edge is going to be more, again, with the, with the perpendicular at a right angle. <laughs> uh, you know, if this is rubbing against here, that's gonna be a scraping cut and it's going to be slicing when the cutting edge, which is closer to me right now, is more flush with the tool and it's going to be just slightly angled in. So this is one way to explain it and I'll say it a few different ways, but I wanted to show you on a finished bowl because it might be easier to see, less distracting with um, all the ridges and bumps. Let's see, we'll see if that actually helps. So when I'm applying my tool, I have to reference each face, you know, a round thing is, Really, a round thing can be made up of many lines, you know, all right next to each other. And each one of those I kind of think of as the face. So how I apply my tool on the bottom of the bowl versus on the side of the bowl, I'm following this shape. And if you think of the back of the tool here, it's more or less referencing the shape of the bowl, okay? And with the first few passes, I'm just trying to get off the high points and low points. If you just, if you soften your gaze and look at the bowl while it spins, of course you'll have to see this once you're turning from your perspective, is I can see the bowl kind of going to the surface here. So there's high points and low points. 
I can see particularly somewhere around here, there's a higher point that I'm going to have to take off more material. But that's what I'm working on. I'm not trying to get that finished smooth surface on the first pass. And my hand here, I hold the back of the handle with my palm up in my dominant hand. And I find that this is, you're just supporting the tool back here and you're working on rotation this way. So I can curl my wrist in is usually what it's doing. I'm working on this angle and then I can also move in and out. But this arm does not have any inward force. It's kind of the first thing that people tend to do. Um, I find that when you're holding on the top that you tend to be pushing into the bowl more and you don't want to be putting inward pressure. You're going to be putting pressure into the cut that you're making, which is actually moving this way, not towards the material. You're moving material forward. It almost, when you're getting going smoothly, it almost looks like you're working with pottery on a wheel. So my dominant hand is back here, relaxed. My elbow is often close to my body. I have much more control. If it's not in my palm, I have it cradled, like I was saying, as if you're dancing. So my shoulders are back and this hand, and then still I have this rotation here with my wrist, up and down, and in and out. With my non-dominant hand, in this case my left hand, I like to have my hand over the tool rest. I find I have much more control, and it'll often be between two fingers, three fingers, sometimes four, one. Some of it just depends on comfort of where I'm um, working. And this hand, the like power in this hand, it's almost like opening a jar. It's like I'm twisting. So I'm pulling with the fingers that are back here with each pulse of my foot, you'll see. And I'm kind of pushing with this side and that just keeps it very stable. So I can, it's that counterbalance. Every bit has, if you have more tension in one space, you have to counter that on the opposite side. What is it? Every action has an equal, Opposite and equal. Opposite and equal reaction. So I think in every craft, what you're figuring out is the balance of tension between you and the material. Okay, so now we'll start. So right here I have a very obvious corner, a very obvious high point. If we just apply to that, I'm gonna place my tool here and it's gonna work on a little bit of a pivot. That's where we're gonna start. So I'm coming in here and in this case, I'm kind of, I'm creating the edge that I want. So I'm thinking of putting a chamfer on that. So I'm wanting this corner to more or less be in line with the wall of my bowl. So I'm coming in with my cutting edge facing almost slightly, let's see, let's start with it tipping down. I'm sweeping the tip in and this is just here just so it's not cutting very much. But as I open it up, so I'm rotating with my right hand, my dominant hand, I'm slowly opening the tool. And you can hear it's cutting a little bit more. If I were to open it all the way this way, I'm much more likely, it's a very aggressive cut and it's likely to get caught in the wood. So I'm really just trying to take off the littlest bit. And you can hear that it's going ch -ch -ch and then stopping. And that's because it's just getting material off here, but it's barely graced this side. It's because in this orientation, it's higher here and lower here. But if I follow that, you can see on this side, I've started to make a little shoulder. And that's the material that I'm kind of pushing this way. So I don't, if I were to push into the bowl, if you hear this, you don't want to hear that. That's because the back of the tool is referencing this uneven surface too much and you'll often get a very bumpy surface. So I'm basically, I almost want the tool to be floating and just getting the high points off. And this whole time, this tool is just pivoting in here. I'm sweeping down a little bit to help the round shape. 
but you don't have to worry about that right now. Just pivot the tool. Once I've finished that pivot, if I were to swing all the way out, now I'm not cutting at all. And then I can reposition my tool and move it up a little bit. Okay. These are some brand new hooks that we just made and they're pretty sweet, I must say. <laughs> I haven't used them yet. Okay, so I haven't done quite a full pass. As you can see, this side is turned here and then this side is not. So I'm gonna have to do, I'm gonna have to take off more passes in order to get down to those ax marks. But I can, I'll take it all the way up to the top just to work off. You know, before a bunch of people comment, I don't have eye protection on. Whether you think I should or not, I'm, I'm aware of the risks and you'll see that I'm often blinking <laughs> when I'm um, pressing down with the tool. Uh, definitely wear it if it makes you more comfortable. So do that. <laughs> Oh, you can see, so here, I got caught a little bit. It's because there's a much deeper shoulder there. So I went from taking off kind of little bits of material to it got much thicker. And some of that is the orientation of my tool. Some of that is how much power you have behind, you know, with your leg, with the bungee. So you can work through a lot of really thick material if you have the grip to keep it in place and the power behind it. You don't have to be taking off a lot at a time, so don't go for that. But if you're getting stuck, it's not actually just based on one thing. Like if you're, by getting stuck, I mean if your tool's getting sucked into the wood or caught, it could be the angle of the tool. It could be that you don't actually have enough power to like have the tool push through that amount of wood. You might not have enough resistance. Um, so it may not actually just be the one thing about the tool application. Okay, so we still have to come up the rim here. In this case, just to show you, I'll grab the tip down tool. So that was the tip up. It's now the tip down. Up here around the rim, it'll be a little bit easier for me to use the tip down because with the tip up, as I'm coming around, it very much depends on the shape of your bowl. I kind of want to work lower than the, than the center point. And the tip of my tool is what's kind of more likely to get caught here. It's not caught now, but you can kind of see the reference of it getting caught because the tip is in the way. So with the tip down, it's not in the way, so you can really get around there much easier. Thing I need to adjust as my foot is cramping on this log. Something about the angle. Even though this isn't at a finishing point of this, 
where I find a lot of students get stuck on this initial pass is coming up here to the rim of the bowl up here. And it's because everything kind of gets much closer to your body. So if I'm down here on the foot, my body's quite open, my arm is out here, and then as I come around, I'm coming in closer. You know, the whole time you're turning, I'm putting some weight into my tool rest. So I'm leaning in, relaxing, and it gives me a little bit more support with my tool. But as you come around up here to the rim of your bowl, something you can do, particularly with the tip down, is you can work a little bit lower. So that gives you a bit more flexibility than if I'm up here. But if I was up here, I could adjust my tool to be under my arm. But I tend to sweep the tool down and that gives me a little bit more uh, range of motion. It's always the beginning and ending of any craft and process that feels the trickiest. And in this case, there's kind of the beginning and ending of each step. You know, when you first start axing, it feels hard. Doing the last corner axing feels challenging. And in this case, getting all the bumps off is kind of the hardest bit. And then coring at the very end tends to be one, you're tired, but it's always kind of the beginning and end of each step is the trickiest part. So you know, once you get past this, it gets much easier. Okay, so there's our first pass. You can see, turned a lot of this side. We got low points, but none of them are super deep. So there's not actually, I feel, did pretty good on the axing bit. <laughs> uh, sometimes it just takes one extra little nick with, uh, the ax, when you're axing, you have a really low dig in point. Um, that's also why sometimes when you think you're doing more with the ax, you almost take it too far. So sometimes it's better to leave a little bit more material on because with this kind of woodwork, you can't put back on what you've already taken off. So it's all based on your lowest point. So let's do another, another pass. And this time, let's just use the tip down tool to give a little, like to give an option and show now that we have, I want my pen, oh, I have my pencil, <gasps> okay. This is something I try to explain to students. To give you a visual, let me see if I can draw a line. This is just a visual reference, so you can see what I'm pointing to, okay? So when I've said that once you get tool application, every tool you pick up, no matter if you're on the foot, the outside body, the rim, the inside, the core, all of it has similar tool application. So let me tell, tell me if you can see this over here. So I wanna look at the tool. So we're gonna look at that line, okay? So between that line, if you think, that's a, think of that as a straight line, I don't want my tool in this position. It's gonna be very aggressive it's likely to get caught and suck your tool under. Now, if I have the cutting edge away, it's not gonna cut anything. So this is the sharp side and it's not touching the bowl. So it's not gonna cut anything. So I'm, I'm bringing the back of the tool to be basically parallel to, to the surface that I'm wanting to create and the surface that is already there, okay? And then to make a cut, I need to slightly, in this case, with the tip down, I need to open it up. I need to, you almost create a V between that line that I drew and the cutting edge of the tool. So that angle, being at a diagonal to the surface that you're cutting, is how you're going to get slices. If I'm very much like this, I'm gonna get a scraping cut. You can hear the difference. There's a scrape. So in this case, I'm cutting this little shoulder that I've made. That's where my tool is actually. It's scraping on that and then slicing on that one. It sounds technical, <laughs> but once you get that 
that angle that just it's a subtle rotation often to go from a really effective slicing cut gives you a smooth finish scraping cut is something you might use when you're flattening a surface or you're just trying to get rid of some bulk material there's certain spaces where you choose to use that cut but getting the angle and you might understand the angle <laughs> and you get in position and you've got it but then you add power and the bowl wants to move your tool it wants to rotate it it wants to do that so paying attention oh is, like has my tool moved is that why it's difficult so reposition yourself and keep going okay so we're gonna come we're gonna do another pass of cleaning up this time with the tip down tool you see every time I push my leg there's a slight I'm kind of rotating with my hand I'm pulsing I'm pulling into the cut it's like if you if this was a machine that wasn't human powered every time that there was power you wouldn't want to have enough strength behind that cutting edge that it doesn't move so I have to have equal power in my hands and arms to what's being created with the tool so I apply and it, it makes a more effective cut when I'm doing that pulsing What I just did there is I went through a cut and then I'm readjusting my tool. With more practice, you can do it almost without stopping at all. look there's like a little axe mark left there little one left there but otherwise other than those two it's pretty good I would still go over this to get a clean surface I haven't done the bit up here but I might do a little bit of shaping um, to give it a unique some uniqueness but let's take off just a little bit on the top here I didn't mention earlier is as I get started um, after just even a few rounds of turning or one pass or something I want to make sure that my bowl isn't wiggling in place so I kind of grab the mandrel and you'd feel if one of the poppets or the poppets aren't tight enough that there'd be a little bit of play that you want to adjust right away because if it's moving as you're turning then your it's going to be bumpy because the bowl is shifting within the tool um, so that's all been good so I haven't needed to adjust anything like that um, but sometimes yeah you might adjust I like having a foot that's shaped like this because I can adjust the height of the foot really easily by just throwing a round of rope around it um, yeah so we're ready to move on to the foot of the bowl for also good like visual reference this has clearly been sitting on something dirty here's here's like two extremes of a foot I don't know tell me is that angle visible mm -hmm. okay so here there's no wall to the foot the foot is just the base of the bowl that's what we're calling the foot but in this case there's a slight concave here so that when it sits on something it's stable it doesn't roll it doesn't and then in this case there's quite a significant wall it's much more of a Japanese pottery style bowl I really <laughs> I really like turning the foot of my bowl I really like tall foots this feels much more um, in line with what I enjoy doing 
I could have made more of a concave here um, with time. I tend, I'm start, I start to keeping the very central base of my bowls a little bit thicker just because it's the hardest part to reach when you're turning to check the thickness and it's just kind of safety. In this case, I think if I were to redo this bowl, I would have made this a little more hollow, but it's completely operable and fine. But this is what we're going to create next. And I'll aim for making something like this. For a pure contrast, if you want to be a rebel, <laughs> Oliver started making some bowls uh, with no foot. It's kind of contrary to that, is that it actually does wobble, but it doesn't fall over or anything. So that's, it's a, as he says, a rocking locking lid box, <laughs> which is fun. So I want to teach you what gives you a really good usable bowl but I think that there is still so much room for us to be playing with shapes and forms. If you look at electri electric lathe turners and like mainstream, there's such a broad variety of things that are being created on there. And though traditionally this was used mostly for bowls and cups and boxes, I think that with the growth of it again, we can be playing with different forms and shapes. So I encourage you to do that. Okay, so another reason Another reason I'm creating a foot or removing material from the bottom is I'd like to remove the material where this center point is digging in. So there's going to be a slight uh, point made into the bottom of the bowl. So I want to remove enough material while leaving a little stub that I can carve that away at the end. But if I'm going to make a, um, Eh, actually, let's just smooth this out first. So this is a position in which I'm going to use a little bit more of a scraping cut. So if I wanted to do a slicing cut, I'd have to come all the way out here and open all the way up, which you very well might do. But if I just want to do a scraping cut, it doesn't have to have a pretty finish or something, then I don't mind it being more of the cutting edges in contact with the piece. And so I'm just going to I still want to float above the highest point, so I'm not pushing in too much. And this so, is tip up? This one is tip down right now. Oh, tip down. Um, you can use either one. I find that with this cut, similar to when we do the face of the bowl, um, a tip down is easier for this part. This is actually, with making a foot here, you're basically making a little bowl. So the process that you use here is the same that you start when we flip the bowl around. So I'm just going to scrape off a bit there and I'm going to step in a quarter of an uh, inch or half a centimeter, make another scraping cut, another scraping cut. You can see I'm making these ring rings. I'm doing that for also visual purposes so you can see I was kind of stepping in like that. I'm just making it more or less a flat surface. I can even kind of move while I'm scraping it. So it's easier to work with. It gives me something to look at that um, I can visualize more easily. So the first thing I would like to do is make the wall of my foot. So if we more or less use this as the foot here, or where my wall is going to sit, I'm going to come over here and make a shoulder. So when I'm, when I'm this close to a transition point where there's a flat surface here and a round surface here, it's the easiest point to get your tool sucked in. So if you don't have the control here to make sure that it stays in place, your tool might move and there might be a slightly easier foot for you to do. But if you want to make a little wall, I'm coming in just, first I'm just gonna take off very little until I have something to reference. So now I feel quite safe. I have a little bit of a ridge there and that could be enough for your foot. You don't have to do more, but for the sake of being a little different, let's make a bit a taller walled foot. So again, this is, it's like part scraping and part slicing. I showed, I pointed out earlier with the pencil that on this surface, the one that's this way, moving this, it's a scraping cut, but on this surface, it's more of a slicing cut. Now, if I want my foot to be slightly 
angled like this, then I need to bring the tip down tool more under the foot. This is really good practice for coring, which like I said before, and I've also noticed on other videos, it is the most watched part of any of these videos is coring. So this is a good place to practice that because it's the same, same uh, application. So I'm working not totally under the foot, but I'm working further down here. If this was a clock, you know, I'm working at seven or eight o'clock. And I'm putting the back of the tool in here and say I start turning without it even cutting and kind of, okay, let it rub there, let it reference. And then I'm going to slightly open the tool like this. I'm gonna bring it so that the cutting edge can engage, but I'm just gonna go just to where it engages. See those really thin strips? And then keep it in that position and push it forward. Okay, let's say I wanna make it a little more angled. I'm gonna come in. To call that good okay now let's finish the foot and then we'll come back and take care of this corner in a minute oh i almost want to make it taller <laughs> is that okay here i'll take that away see what it looks like let's make it a little taller See what I've done there? This deep groove? This is what we're gonna do on the inside. So let's just leave that there and then do a very similar thing right here. This is basically a mini core, but on the bottom of your foot. And if you don't know what the core is because this is all new to you, you will continue to see as we go. So I'm gonna make a groove just outside of that little nub. This is with the tip down tool again. It's very much a scraping cut, but I'm making a groove in there. And now you don't have to, but it can be very, it's maybe a little easier to swip, switch to the tip up tool. And to show with my pencil, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come about here, make a cut down to that low point, and then I'm gonna step back, make another cut, down to that low point, step back, step back until I've reached the wall thickness that I would like to have for my foot. Okay, so I come in, I just step back a few millimeters, quarter of an inch or so away. Now, the way I'm applying my tool here feels very different than here. I said if I was in this position on the outside of the bowl that it would be very aggressive and you'd be very likely to get sucked in or stuck, but here, now I'm referencing this flat surface. So in this case, you are referencing this flat surface. I mean, it's round. Hopefully you get what I mean. But now I'm coming here and I'm almost working under the center point. And if I angle the cutting edge slightly away, start turning, okay? And this is just, you know, to figure out where that, what angle you need the tool in order to be cutting so I turn it away and I start pedaling and then I'm slightly rotating in. Oh, now it's cutting. So now I just, just stay there. And then I push against that shoulder that I've made or I'm making down to that low point. Now, if I go all the way into there, I'm gonna get sucked in because this position relative to the nub is basically the same as this here, getting sucked in. So I've done that first sweep. I can step back, do it again. can leave that because I'll come back with the other tool. Okay, let's see. So coming out here and starting a cut is definitely possible, but it's you're much more likely to get caught. So it's good to bring the tool kind of just inside just inside the edge. Again, keep it rotated out, rotate in. It's a very light cut. 
Now this is just, I'm just gonna use as kind of a finishing cut for my inside. I'm just taking off whispers, little whispers. You can even hear the difference in sound. You know, there's, there's some little bits here, like that's an ax mark. I'm not that worried about it. I might add a tiny chamfer on the corner here, just to, it's less likely to kind of get bumped in use there. So it's just a tiny little chamfer, but that's fine with me. And I think that's, that's a good, a good foot. Now, if I use the tip down, I can clean off like I did before. So now it's a scraping cut again, to repeat, it's a scraping cut on the face that's in this profile and more of a slicing cut on the core there. And then that's what I do for now. And then the rest I'm gonna take off um, when we take it off the lathe with another tool, with a spoon knife or a hook knife. Okay, so now we have this here to deal with. I think one of the parts, even with practice, that I see a lot of turners, um, pole lathe turners have uh, trouble with, or I might be more anally <laughs> attention to detail on that part, is getting the foot to bowl transition. So right now there's still a bit of material to kind of move in here. So let me move that away with a bit of a scraping cut. But to get in there, this is where sometimes tool shape really makes a difference to what's possible, to like the kind of angle that you can put into a tool or into the foot. Um, and why often there's a rough bit there in your transition from the foot to the bowl is that your tool, like I've said a few times now, is it's slicing or cutting on this wall the one that's angled in this direction, but it's scraping on this one. So you can't get a nice finish in there. So you you have to get, either you need a certain tool to do it, but depending on the tool that you have, you have to you know try to get as close into the foot very gently to be getting a slicing cut. So you have to usually open the tool up quite a bit. And I just, I just really try to take off a very, very little bit until I am. And ash is definitely, because it has an open grain structure, sometimes it's harder to get a really nice finish on that. So I might just leave that for now. If I was really doing it myself, I might be more specific. Okay, now at this point, um, I might do one more pass here on the outside to clean some things up, but if we wanna do something here on the rim, as is, we can just leave it there. I, let's see. So in this case, again, to give you a finished visual reference, if we create something kind of like this, where there's this rim, I mean, this is kind of the proper rim of your bowl, but let's say the rim starts here. Or I don't have another word for this section of the bowl. But in order to do that, I need a little bit of a shoulder here to it, adding a little bit of a shoulder, a bead, a bump, it, it highlights that feature of the bowl a little bit more. Uh, and so what I'll do is I have a little shoulder, let's make it a little deeper. So basically I've created another shoulder and I'm gonna come up to that previous one. a little bit more significant, yeah? So if I wanna leave a little ridge there, I'm gonna take that shoulder and I'm gonna cut it in half. So I'm gonna take the tool and instead of having the back reference the wall of the bowl, I'm gonna cut it in half. So again, these little details come with some practice of making sure you can anchor your tool in place and work with it. So if I'm putting it there, if I'm not stable, then it's gonna suck in my tool. And 
And a lot of that stability is coming from this hand and that, that kind of jar motion, like I'm saying, by twisting into the cut, it makes it a really, I can really hold the tool very securely and take off really fine shavings if I want to. So I'd like to make this slightly convex so we have a bit of material to take off. I was just saying a moment ago that uh, off camera that turning certain woods, they sound different. <laughs> and I find the ash to sound quite different. Okay, so I'm just moving that bit up. I'm gonna come back. I'm kind of, I'm starting to angle my tool in a little bit so that it will create a bit more of a sweep. depending on the kind of rim that you want to make. Um, I might leave, leave a little bead right here, but I need, to, my rim is going to be based off of the lowest point on the top, which I'm pretty sure is right here. You can kind of see, yeah, I think this is my lowest point. So I don't, I don't need to turn much higher than this because I'm going to come back from the other side and turn quite a bit of this down to get down to this lowest point here. So I'm going to do one little pass here to make it just a little bit cleaner and increase the convex. Um, something that I, I didn't mention earlier is as you're starting turning at all, it is, it's a really great tool to think of there being an anchor point here as you have your tool um, on the tool rest. And as you turn, you make a pivot until you're no longer cutting, slicing, the tool is no longer engaged with the material, and then you reposition your tool and keep going. If, the t if as you do that, you stay in a very singular plane here, you'll end up with a bowl with little convex shapes in it. And so if you sweep the tool down slightly, as you're, you're mimicking the roundness of the bowl, you're less likely to have that happen. If that happens, like that was very normal for a lot of my bowls for a long time. And why I mention it now is you can use that intentionally for a decorative feature. So if you want a little bit of a dip here, I'm going to get more of an anchor point and move through that anchor point to have it uh, make that arc intentionally. feels good. What I'm going to do, give you a visual, is that my rim on the other side, you can even see up here, it's just going to be with the tool. Um, my bowl's going to stop somewhere around here. You can see that little mark. But when we flip it around, I'll work down to that point. So that's an outside of a wooden bowl on the pole lathe. Okay, so we've finished the outside of the bowl. So now we need to take it off the lathe, flip it around, and start the inside. So what you wanna do is you wanna hold this because it's still, it's under tension. So as you uh, release or loosen the poppet, you don't want it to fall off. You also don't want it to bump into the centers and put a ding mark or there's often like a little bit of, um, 
black residue in there. So you want to avoid that. So I hold the mandrel tight. I usually put my hip um, in front of the wedge so it doesn't fly out because I just need to loosen it and then I can take it off like this. Now something I just realized I didn't say at the beginning is I can't just take this and turn this around because you need to have the rope between you and the mandrel. So as I wind it that I did the first time, when I had this between my legs here, I'm gonna put it on this, uh, this way. As I start with the rope between me and the mandrel, because if it's on this side, it's gonna rotate in the opposite direction and the tools we have and such and the technique we're using wouldn't work. So you wanna make sure that the rope, whatever you're using here, is between you and the mandrel. I think it was about that. And then I'm gonna place the button here on this one. So I already have my centers. I don't need to redo anything there. Just flipping it around. I'm gonna put some tension in there while I tap the wedge in. Make some slight I can feel a slight wiggle, so I'm just adjusting. Yep. Okay, I think we're good. Extra measure. Okay. Isn't it crazy how it almost looks like it's been dyed pink, this ash? So I'm going to move my tool rest closer. Again, earlier I was saying, you know, I want my fingers to be able to pass, but I'm not going to be passing here. So you can have it closer than you even might think. Might have to shift this over a little bit now that that's there. I think I had one more wrap before, but instead of redoing that, I'm just going to raise my pedal by looping it around there. Okay. So, the inside, this face here, we've already gone through the steps I'm going to show on the foot. So you get to repeat that process. It's when you turn your first bowl or bowls, as you start to finish the outside, you basically, like you start getting used to it and you're like, ah, oh, I'm getting it. And then you flip it and it might feel like a completely new process. But like I said before, once you get acquainted and understand how to apply the tool, you're on a different face of the bowl, a different facet um, plane, however you want to refer to it, the tool application is still the same. It's in a different position, but the way that the cutting edge is meeting the wood is the same. So on the top here, it's you know a bit uneven. So we just kind of want to flatten that out to give us a clean surface to work with. Here I'm going to mostly do scraping cuts, um, similar to what I did before. I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit so that you can see um, more or less what I'm doing. But first I'll just take off this uh, outer corner. It's like I'm slicing off the corner, putting a chamfer. And this is tip up or tip down? Right now I'm using the tip down. I find that this step is definitely a little easier with the tip down. Okay, so like when we started the first um, at the beginning, I've only cut here, but I haven't cut almost anywhere else around. And you wanna work incrementally so that you're not trying to take off too much. I don't wanna position my tool at the lowest point because then it's gonna be trying to take off too, mater too much material. So if visually you're finding it hard to know where to start your tool, I, I use my leg to position it to where I wanna start. So right here I've given myself the highest point and then I'm going to place my tool just outside of that, let it float off of the bowl a little bit and then I can start turning and then slowly engage my tool. And by engaging, I'm moving it on this small arc. almost kind of turned something all the way around, but this low point, like I said, I haven't worked down to that. So let's go down to there. A 
up almost. And okay, so now I've passed it. And that's where I was saying my rim was about to end. You, it's actually nice right now because you can see the color change. So a lot of woods um, oxidize as they're, um, when like the fleshy part of the tree meets air, a lot of times it'll turn yellow, pink, orange. And so right now it's to the benefit because you can see the new cut and that's where my cut on the other side ended. So that's you, where the top of my bowl is actually gonna sit. So right now I have quite a bit of material to take off the top here and that's all because of this low point. And that was what I was basing it off of. So now we're just going to do some scraping cuts of bringing that down. So I'm still not quite there, but like I said, I was going to exaggerate it, that I'm often moving in steps. It doesn't always look like this, but I basically find a position and then I hold that position and I might swing a little bit out like that or down, but I'll pick a position and work that part down and then I can readjust anchor So basically all the way down. But to smooth that out a little bit, I'll, this isn't like for looks, it's just so I can see what I'm working with. I am now moving the tool down like this. Okay, so step number one, out, or I don't know, step number wherever we are <laughs> after that, once I've uh, flattened this surface, it's much easier for me to see what I'm working with and see my, um, I've gotten rid of all the highs and lows. Now comes the laborious bit. So what we're going to do is we're removing all the material except for a core here. So I can show you an example of what another bowl core looked like. So this was, would have had the mandrel in it and it's been split to get it off of the mandrel. But we're going to create this internally while also then shaping the internal wall and removing the bulk of the bowl. <clears throat> so if you start, well, kind of depends on the size of the bowl. Um, I think it's good practice to only really remove as much material as you need to remove. Um, later learning how to nest and things like that you can make the most use of material but it is a bit trickier so sometimes it takes more time you just have to find the balance for you but in this case you know i'm going to start i can start a good inch out or a few centimeters out from the mandrel and not really worry about that internal bit later i might come back and narrow it down a little bit so i'm using my tip down tool and i'm going to pick where i want it and like anchor myself in place and make a channel there. It's a really good practice to kind of make as deep a channel as you can because by learning to do that, you're, you're coring or like you're boring into the wood, which is really helpful if you ever want to do cup turning or something like that something else that requires a really deep dive. So if you remember, as we did on the foot, now I've made this deep channel. I'm gonna come with my tip up tool and say I'll come there, sweep down to the bottom. I'll step back, step back, step back, step back, step back. So I start internally and then I move in and then I step back and I'm just sweeping material away with each time. And then once I've come all the way out to here, I'll take the tip down again, deepen my channel, create more of a core. 
And so the tool orientation, just to remind us, is the back of my tip up is now referencing or parallel to the face or top of the bowl here. And then I can, I'm just slightly rotating in until it's cut in. Okay, I'm gonna make this a little deeper because I wanna go to the lowest point there, but I don't wanna take my tool too close to the core or else it's going to suck it in. When you're hollowing your bowl, you're really doing the same step over and over and over again. And so you have a lot of time to practice, <laughs> depending on the size of your bowl. And I think it's a really good practice to create a nice finish with, with each one of your cuts. It may feel pointless because this is all just gonna go away. But if you practice that from the very beginning of coring your bowl, by the time you actually get to the wall of your bowl, you'll have a lot of practice in trying to get a clean cut. Um, it can be really tempting to just use a scraping cut for most of the coring. Some of the reasons also not to do that is one, you're gonna have a really rough surface to clean up at the end. It's definitely harder on your tools to be you know, rubbing against the surface flat like that, and you'll have to sharpen more often. Um, so far, I haven't felt with these tools that like they had a fresh sharpening before we started turning. I haven't felt like I had to sharpen them at all. Um, they're still making a really fine finish. The turning feels easy relative to the work <laughs> that it takes to use a pole lathe, but uh, yeah. So reasons not to, uh, use scraping cuts as much as you don't need them is it's also can be harder on your body like you're holding it really in place as much as having control takes quite a bit of stability I'm not really needing to grip like I do when I do a scraping cut So there, if you heard, I kind of got stuck because there's all this material here and then the tip just got caught in one of those things. So I'm not gonna come out much further for now, but I can switch to the tip down. And right now what's already starting to happen is the core is shaped like a pyramid in this direction, but I actually want to be encouraging it straight and then eventually at the bottom towards the pyramid in this direction so that I can snap it. So what I wanna do is take down the walls here, which it's the same approach as creating the wall of the foot and also the little nub on the foot. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm, it's really helpful to create a shoulder like that. And like I've said a few times now, with this cut, I'm using quite a bit of the cutting edge of the tool. So this part of the tool up here is more scraping on this face and then the tip here is slicing on that face. I think a lot of people have a hard time with coring because the tool is like more of the cutting edge is engaged and as you get deeper in you can't actually see necessarily what your tool is doing. Uh, so it's a little harder to hold it in place 
So if that gets too wide there, like my tool is starting to go into that, I can split that in half, make little stairs. And then just come back up. Okay, so I am gonna make that deeper so that I can go further in with my tip up tool. You can see my tool is like I can't actually see the tip of my tool right now. It is, at, if this is a clock face again, it's almost at six o'clock. But that is allowing me to get a little bit deeper than if I was up here, I'd feel much riskier that the tool's gonna get caught and I have, I can't really go as deep. And I will say, not all of the tools that we own can go that deep. So the shape of a tool is definitely going to limit or, or hinder or influence kind of what you're able to do like that. So, but that's a really good practice to be able to get in there. So again, like I showed with the pencil mark, I'm gonna take a step here, sweep in, step back, sweep in. I don't want to go too close so I don't get caught on the core. If you see that, that whole bit there that I'm doing is I'm bringing the tool and I'm with like, I'm pulsing here and then I'm slightly eh, moving in, pulsing eh, and so I'm kind of just very subtly, not very fast. Because if I were to stay in one position to show you what would happen, I'd sweep out pretty fast. So by in one position, I mean that this is just arcing through, which you're totally fine to do. Cause then I could adjust a little bit lower. Which I think is much better practice to just get a clean sweep than to worry about stepping in and moving. But I wanted to say that I was doing something differently. So if you've ever done any spoon carving, the application of the tool, the way that it's sitting would be similar to this being the bowl of a spoon. You know, you're scooping through the wood like this. The back of your hook knife is almost flush with the spoon and then just slightly engaged, just like the bowl of a spoon. You wouldn't take the hook knife and the bowl of the spoon and go like this. It wouldn't have a nice finish. So again, that's the scraping cut when it's at a right angle to it. And then when it's almost flush with the material and you go, that's the movement without a spinning piece. So I'm gonna take the tip down again, make another dive. Um, 
yeah, I'll just... If when you turn it doesn't go that deep, and it only does something like this, that's fine. You'll have to kind of swap back and forth a little bit more, uh, but don't worry about that. Something, uh, you don't necessarily have to swap tools between each thing. Some of that depends on the shape of your hook again. Uh, you could turn a bowl with just one of these hooks dependent on the shape. Some people only use tip ups. I tend to use the tip down more. <laughs> uh, kind of personal preference. But instead of switching to the tip up, I can use closer to the tip of this tool, the tip down, to do some of the sweeping like I was with the tip up. Depending on the tools you have, you can try it out, but you can swap back and forth with one tool. Some of the risk here is that the tip is a bit more vulnerable if you don't have control. It almost sounds like there's a harder bit of the wood where you could hear it chattering. Maybe. Sometimes that sounds like a knot. Yeah. Right here, there's a bit of, I can feel it. Okay, I am gonna use the tip up because that one's not ideal for that cut, I don't think. So right now with the bowl, the whole thickness of the bowl is still a good inch and a half or more. Up here it's thin and then it gets really thick and then it's quite even. So I wanna start thinning out the whole shape to give more space within my bowl. So I'm going to start working from up to here, but before I do that, I'm going to shape my rim just a little bit more. You, if you start thinning the walls of your bowl, depending on how fast you're turning. Um, the, when the wood is green, it can even start to warp slightly on the lathe. And so if you've only done an inch or a few centimeters of the wall, and then the rest of it is really thick, it can start to warp. And if it, say you wanna go over for another finishing cut, you need to be aware that it might warp, and then you'll have this where you're just cutting, like cut, no cut, cut, and so you'll get like a spiral to the finish. So you want to, as you thin the wall, you kind of want to finish it as you go. It's dependent on how fast you're turning, the kind of wood it is, how hot it is outside. The second bowl that I ever turned, I turned over seven days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that is like common at all, but I just want people to know that I like, axing and turning took me seven days of like an hour or two every day. It would just go in a, like a plastic bag with a bunch of shavings between each day. It does not have to happen in one go. The more tired you are, the harder it is <laughs> to keep going. Okay, so up to the rim. I'm going to, just like we did at the beginning of the face, I'm going to chamfer this off a little bit because I still have this here that I need to work down. And yeah, so I'm using the tip down tool. And I, I, I can just do a scraping cut here, but because I'd want a nice finish down around my rim, I'm going to take it at a bit more um, of an angle so that I'm really trying to do more of a slicing cut. And you can hear the difference. Here, slice and cut, scraping cut. It's almost more high pitched to do a scraping cut. Maybe the mics pick them up the other way though. Maybe it's not more high pitched. So in this 
bit right here on this kind of wood, it's, it's chippy. Like it kind of happens almost no matter how I cut it. So I'm going to, I'm gonna round this over just a little bit with my tip down and then I'm gonna to swap tools and try to bring that in so that I'm not chipping off um, pieces there on the edge. Uh, I think I'm happy with that. You know, it's hard to start and if you're having a really hard time, it could very much just be that you're starting or it could be the additional challenge because of the kind of wood you have or if your tools aren't sharp. So be easy on yourself. Just, just one question I only just realized is maybe briefly touching on the rhythm aspect of when your foot is going up and down yeah. of the tool connecting with mm -hmm. the piece that you're working on. Yeah. So for example, obviously being a reciprocal lathe, um, you know, it's, meaning it's not like a power lathe, right. where it's going in one motion the whole time, Yeah, because it's gonna go it in opposite directions. Um, yeah. Hopefully totally. you catch my drift. <laughs> I get what you mean. And I, I don't, I think I barely touched on it earlier, but didn't say much of that. So as this, as I'm pedaling and turning, I'm only cutting as the bowl spins toward me. <laughs> and then when it's spinning away from me, as my leg is lifting, I'm not cutting. The tool is not doing anything. And so that is the pulsing. So I'm pulsing as I press down, I'm engaging my tool. So that kind of pulse into the wood. This is an exaggeration. As I push down, I'm engaging and then I'm releasing as my body releases. It's almost like a breath. So I'm like, it's like you're breathing in and expanding. So you're kind of opening up between each cut. Because if I keep my tool pressed the whole time, you can hear it bouncing around versus you can still hear it, it like bumping the wood a little bit. So I'm not moving it away that much, but I am pulsing your tool. You are applying the tool to the wood. Oftentimes it almost feels like it's floating in space and the cutting edge is just engaging with the wood. You do not want the tool referencing the wood a whole lot because then it will influence the finish of your bowl. So that pulsing with your leg and the tool is important. And it comes with practice and time. Does that cover it? Does that, yeah. it does, thank you. <laughs> okay. So right now I have the tip up and coming out here, kind of like I said, down on the foot, when you're at a transition moment, like a corner on your bowl of any point, where, whether it's a decorative feature, the foot up here on the rim, bringing the tool in, if I come out here and I don't have control, this is just gonna suck my tool right in and it's gonna mess up your rim. It happens a lot, <laughs> it happened to a lot of my bowls um, at, when I started. So. As I come in here, one, I want to be very intentional and careful. So I'm going to come and kind of do a finer cut. Um, and I'm going to come in not with, not going to come in blazing. I'm not going to bring in the cutting edge too aggressively. So right now I actually have the cutting edge like turned away from the bowl here. And then I'm going to start pedaling and I'm going to start doing this very slowly as I'm pedaling while holding it in place until it starts cutting, just like that. And once you start to get the cut established, it's easier to make it a bit more aggressive. Okay. So I'm looking at this, I'm trying to get a nice finish up here. And then I'm gonna start to set kind of where I want my wall thickness to be. So again, keep the tool turned away, start pedaling and then slightly rotate in. Now it started cutting. Again. I'm just gonna go one more to kind of show you what I'm gonna aim for. So just there, 
I was following, my tool actually went down and then kind of swept up and then over again. So it was sweeping and why I was moving that is it's because I wanted to follow how much wood it was cutting because if I'd kept the same angle, it would have dug in and been trying to take off too much material at once. So now I can bring a lot of this in down to this low point and start to thin out the walls. quite a bit of material here but I might come in with my tip down <laughs> the inside where it's definitely a bunch of shavings on me it's spraying you much more <laughs> so I know people are bothered by me not wearing glasses but <sighs> it's one of my things I risk <laughs> but if you watch I'm actually blinking at the same time okay um, so this core right now is pretty straight. It's more, it's almost like an extension of the mandrel, but much fatter. So I want to start to taper it in so that I can also get lower in the bowl. Now here, definitely understandably tricky because I'm usually starting a cut where I can't see. I have the tip down, can't see the tip at all. It's also almost under my mandrel. But to get that cut established, I don't want to be like this. I'm going to get stuck. So I'm coming with the flat bit of the tool, referencing the bottom side of this core. But I, I'm not pressing into it right now. It's just grazing there. And then I'm going to slowly open it up. So that's at about what, seven o'clock? Yeah, seven or six almost even. Dep it kind of depends on the size of your bowl, size of the core. Um, and as I, as I slowly turn the cutting edge in, I'm able to, like everywhere else, establish a little shoulder that I push down. So my tool is going, I'm barely changing the angle just enough to stay engaged with the wood. So similar to the practice of getting a smooth finish with every bit that you take out on the inside, also getting like a smooth core, it kind of seems pointless, um, but by intentionally practicing that just as much as having the finished bowl, it gives you more tools as you keep turning, as if you want to turn nested things, if you want to turn something else where you're going to need a cleaner surface. So, yeah. Let's do another. Okay, now I'm still, I'm gonna make another deep channel and then switch to the tip up tool. Yep. There we go. Always stopping and feeling. If your bowl at any time kind of came off center, you want to make sure that you actually feel the thickness all the way around. Because if you do go, if something happened where it wobbled, then you'll have a thinner side and a thicker side um, or two thin points and two thick points or something. So you want to make sure that you don't just feel the thickness in one position. So carefully put your hand in there and you can rotate and feel. If it feels like that's completely blind to you, how thick that is, pick up something else that you can see, put your fingers around it, be like, okay, that's that thick. Okay, it's definitely thicker than that. You know, give yourself a reference point. Okay, let's 
my walls still up here are thicker than I'd like them, so I'm gonna start to bring that down again. pretty good to me. But now maintaining that all the way through is something that also comes with practice. <laughs> end. There's still a bit more to do to thin the walls out and do some finishing cuts, but as I've gone through all this material, again it's amazing that this tiny hook does so much work. Um, I can just show you briefly how we sharpen the tools. Oftentimes what we use to sharpen is just here on the lathe or right next to us, so we kind of just sharpen as we go. Um, so. I take the tip of the tool, you can see that it's been done here quite a bit by the um, ebonizing, is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so that's not the right word. Anyways, you can all laugh at me and type it in the comments. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to lay the tip here and I'm, this is a generic inexpensive diamond file or not even maybe not even a diamond file um, a cone shaped file you can use um, this is just like a chainsaw file they come in different sizes and different grits um, so a cone shaped file something that fits in here and the key really is that as you're moving so I'm I'm kind of rolling and pressing down is that I don't want to go in one spot because then I'm going to make a divot in the cutting edge. So I'm just consistently moving the tool, the sharpening tool, and the hook, kind of rocking it back and forth. If you're new to sharpening, it's really helpful to put like a bit of Sharpie in there and then you can see that you're actually grinding the parts that you want. I think it's important to mention that because of the way you guys make the tools, mm -hmm. that you keep it at a certain level, keep as in there's a bit of a hollow. Yes, yeah, there is, it's, before the, t uh, the hook is curled, it's been ground down all the way in there so that it gives it, um, it's much easier to sharpen and stays sharper longer so that you have the right uh, angle of how the bevel moves through the tool. So once I've done that, you might feel, you should feel a little burr on the back side. And then I just take, this is some kind of diamond file. You can use some stone. And I'm just gonna do this just enough to take off the burr. I'm not really doing a whole lot. I'm not putting a huge amount of pressure. If you have a very dull tool, of course you'll have to do more work, but typically as we turn, it takes less than a minute to sharpen, which probably out of all the things we do, these might be our sharpest tools. <laughs> the easiest to sharpen. I'm rubbing it off a bit, so, because now you've created little metal dust and just trying to prevent it from marking the inside of my bowl. Okay, 
same with my fingers. So, right now, something you can't really see is it goes thin here and then it starts to get a little bit thicker and it kind of tapers into a thicker thing. For a lot of people, this will be a fine bowl, but I'd like to take it down and I'm aiming for an even thickness um, throughout the bowl. Ooh, I just, it would be interesting to ax it at the end to actually show what it looks like. I'd be willing to do that. <laughs> okay, so when I'm getting to these final steps, I'm feeling, okay, where does it go from the thickness that I want? And then I, where does it start to get larger? Because I don't need to start at the top every single time I'm making a cut. So it starts to get thick somewhere in here, just a few centimeters in, half an inch in. So I'm gonna start here. Now that my bowl is so much more open and hollow, I'm working lower. So my tool is at this angle. And this is where doing things like adjusting your tool rest a little bit closer or a little bit farther away might make the sweep that you wanna to make to finish it a little bit easier, more graceful to do. So mess with those things as you turn. You can tell it's sharpened and getting these little angel hair. <laughs> Feel again. Okay, that's feeling good. I'm going to do a little bit more. Something you can do if you can't tw quite tell the thickness is if you take a phone or um, something with a, a, a flashlight or something and you hold it up against the wood and look on the inside, hold it on the outside and move it round, you'll see the light dim and brighten. And so where it's dimmer, it's thicker. And then where it's brighter, it's thinner. Now, just because there's translucency in your bowl and light is coming through. It's still maybe pretty thick. It's, you know, there's still water in there, which helps it be brighter um, and spread more. Certain woods also are more translucent, see-throughable <laughs> than other ones. <laughs> okay, so I still have this lip here, but because um, there's still a bit on the base that I wanna take off. So I'm gonna do another bit with the tip down. I can even see, I don't know if the camera, but here I can see that it goes light, dark, light, and then gets darker again. This dark stripe is this little bead on the outside. So from here, it gets a little thicker. So right now, it's about the same thickness here and here. And then this is darker, but that's just gonna be the case because there's a little bit more wood there. And then it starts to get a little thicker. So I'm still gonna take off a few more runs. If you're here and you're feeling it tricky, a lot of it is a repetition of what you've done before. So I take the back of the tool and I'm, you know, it's sitting parallel to the face that I'm cutting. 
and then as I when I start turning I'm going to slightly rotate the cutting edge in and then once it's engaged then I'll follow that and keep it going and kind of again when I did earlier with the pencil if you can I don't know if the camera registers these little white lines in here and then the angle of the cutting edge it's like a little check mark so you're at an angle you're cutting which makes that slice and a clean finish As I'm getting to the bottom of the bowl, I'm needing to really rotate the hook to match the base of the bowl. If I don't do that, then I'm just gonna go through the bottom side. So that's also dependent on the shape of your bowl. So you're also adjusting your body as well, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, I'm starting to kind of, part of it's to see a little bit more of what I'm doing. Um, so I've like angling my upper body. You definitely don't, you wanna pay attention to your neck and shoulders and all of that this whole time. The frame is, like I've said before, um, but yes, I'm, I am slightly angling my body. I kind of thought while we, made this that I'd be switching legs, but with all the talking, I'm not getting tired. So <laughs> <laughs> my legs get to rest every few minutes. It's actually more the pace that I might work at at home. <laughs> okay, it's just, there's just a bit more in here and then we'll finish off the core. Okay. So now I feel good about a pretty even thickness. I tend to like to take my bowls thin. I don't think this one is actually that thin. We'll, we'll see in the end. Um, but I think it's definitely good enough. So now we need to make this core go in more extreme so that it's something that we can snap. And so I have a few options. We've already gone over it a little bit. I could start all the way up here. You know, leaving your core kind of big and starting up here is almost easier because you can see where you're starting. And I'm making that shoulder. So first let's take that down. Can you hear the wood sounding hollow? Mm. <laughs> it makes me, <laughs> I'm like, oh, is it too thin? I don't think it isn't. I think it's the ash again. So something I'm also paying attention to as I get in here, so I don't want my tool to be rubbing against the rim of my bowl. One, it might leave a mark. You might also crack your bowl in the twerk here. Um, I did that many a time. <laughs> so as you get in there, especially if you have a deeper bowl, it's tricky to figure out how do I get that core to taper. So again, my tip down tool, I, ca I can't even see the tip at all based on the size of this bowl. So it is out of view in here, but you can with the camera. And so it's here, and then I'm gonna slightly turn it in so that the cutting edge engages. And you've gone this far in the bowl, even if it's your first one, even if it's your 20th one, you know, you've been using the hook in the same way at other points. So I'm gonna create that shoulder and I'm gonna just keep working that shoulder down. I don't wanna to put too much pressure down on this end and up into this because then it really starts to bounce and it gets harder to get um, just an effective cut. But I need to do so a little bit so that it keeps tapering. 
And if you play with it and you have slight rotations, it changes what your cut feels like. You can hear it really scraping down there. It's partially because it's quite deep in there and the angle is tricky to get to. Okay, have to do some more. So the key with this, you're not going into the base of the bowl, you're going into the actual um Going into the core, core and the I core. don't, I don't want to make the lowest point or the narrowest point right at the base. Um, sometimes, I, I, maybe even nine times, nine times out of ten, it would be fine. But once you snap it, if it's too narrow right there at the bottom, it just might lift up some of the fibers. Um, if your base is a little too thin, um, then you can still leave some extra material in there. So material. So I'm going to taper it in you know, a centimeter or so above. Another reason this is tricky is your tool is really far off of your tool rest. So there's a lot of like play this way and even there's even potentially some slight bend in your tool. So. It's another reason coring is kind of tricky is because you're not up and close to it. But if I get close, well, if I get closer, I'm able to open up a little bit more and have maybe a little more control. Worth trying. It's more of a slice and cut, so that's good. Nicer on your body and your tool. Okay, another one. going to clean up this a little bit so it's a little nicer to turn some of this away. So I'm almost there. I just have a little bit more. I'm going to make this a little narrower and get in there. How small it needs to be is a little bit relative, like a lot of the parts to the kind of wood, how big your bowl is, and also how thick the base might be. If you have a thicker wall, um, and base of your bowl, then you can have a thicker um, taper on your core. If it's a thinner wall, then it's going to pull out the base. It's happened a lot. Lose your bottom, drop your bottom. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna make this smaller right now. It's, I don't know, like quarter, two pound, depends on who I'm talking to, you know, I don't know, it's something like this right now but I'm gonna try and take that down. Before I do that, before you're at the very, very end, um, kind of a trick that some folks use, again, it kind of depends on the wood, um, but you can burnish your bowl a little bit with, now these are actually quite dry, even though they were just turned, um, by taking some dry shavings. Now, I'm, I'm saying to do this because all of our bowls, everything that we make is not sanded. Everything is just a tool finish. Um, almost all the things that we do in wood are just a tool finish. And when you have sharp tools and good technique, you really don't need to sand something. And when you do sand something, you really need to work up to very high grit because sandpaper is essentially ripping the wood um, fibers. And so you have to make those little tears that you're making smaller and smaller and smaller to actually polish them. Some folks, yeah, and then when it goes in and out of water, then um, if it's been sanded, the fibers lift. That's why some people don't like eating with wooden spoons, but a tool finish, really good. But if you're finding that there's still some bits, um, sometimes burnishing with some wood shavings, or I've also used a little piece of wood or a stone, um, but you want to be careful because your hand is going to be inside while you're turning. So I'm going to take a bit of this just to show by example and I'm putting equal pressure between my hands. I'm not pulling on the bowl at all. But I'm just going to run it over the edge. If there was any fuzzy bits it might get that off. Not entirely necessary but 
You want to do that before you're right at the very end because if that um, core is too tiny, then it might be too fragile as you're putting your hands in there. Okay, last bit, so a few more, one more cut or so. So now my tool to put it in and pull it out, it's at quite an open angle, which up here would be way too aggressive. But down in there where it's tapering, I have to be open at that angle to even have any kind of cut. And I'm holding it very firmly. Yep, you can even see I get caught. If you're getting caught, I could make this even smaller. I can also use, there's a few different tools you could choose to use. Sometimes you can even use the tip up, but you need to be careful not to break the tip off. But if I put the tip in there, in the little channel that I've just made with the tip down, once I get the cut started, The tip up has, because it's actually curved towards the core, it can get a little deeper in than this one can. Okay, I feel good about that. You ready? The moment of truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, I'm gonna hold hold my mandrel, I'm putting my hip in front of my wedge, tapping it through. I just do that so it doesn't go flying out behind me. Take this off. Okay. So here we have a bowl almost finished. And what I wanna do is I'm going to make the bowl standing in front of me as if it was in the tree. So I can see the rings here, the end grain, is on the top and bottom, and I'm gonna take this, I'm going to pop the core out. So I just, get... to, just, just to reiterate then, so the grain is going down, mm -hmm. and you're pulling the opposite way? Yes, I'm pulling across the grain, with it standing as if it was standing in a tree, still alive. I get quite, I've gotten quite a few questions um, online asking why I don't go the other way. Um, those questions have showed up on a bowl where I've done that and the bottom has come out. I've made the bottom too thin um, and they wonder if it would be better this way. But in this direction, one, you're like, you're trying to basically split the tree from the top, like from the end grain up, which is going to be quite difficult and you're more likely to tear the grain. So in this case, it should just more open up like a book. And if you've made this small enough and your bottom isn't too thin, it's never an issue. So it would be more a personal flaw of my turning by making it too thin or my core not thin enough. Okay, you ready? Well, that was easy. <laughs> Sometimes if yours is thicker, it might be, ugh, you have to like tighten your core and everything. But now we have the core and we have a bowl. And this little nubbin on the outside and inside we'll take off with a hook knife. Remove this with an ax. Yeah, and then we're done with the bowl. It's beautiful. Okay, so here, right now I have a scorp. Any hook knife, um, like spoon knife will do. There are some special bottoming tools. The bottoming tool is basically it would look similar to the hooks we were turning with, but just come in and shave off like that. So if people are not familiar, who's the scorp made by? This scorp is made by Lee Stoffer. It's a beautiful tool. Mine is, mine is new, so <laughs> you're seeing me use it for only the third or fourth time. And obviously it needs to say whatever curved knife, spoon yeah, knife exactly. people I have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, any hook knife that I've had has been very suitable for this job. Um, yeah, it's definitely easy. Some people, sometimes you can use, if you have a curved chisel or something that you can get in there, uh, but what you wanna be careful of is not having the blade then hit one of the walls of your bowl. So here, I put it between my legs like this and squeeze it so I could let go. And I hook my 
the thumb of my non-dominant hand around the back side. And I have this here, and I'm my right hand, my dominant hand, really isn't doing much except for like stabilizing the tool. And so when I do this, I'm able to, like the tool, because my fingers are also hitting the wall, I'm not pulling it all the way in. It's really just small movements. Sometimes the core here is much smaller. Depends on the day. So are you going with the grain or against the grain? I'm going across, yeah, across the grain. So I have the end grain here, side to side and going across the grain. If I was going with the grain, the hook tool, again, it'd be like, like I was saying, splitting the tree open like this. It's gonna kind of get wedged and stuck in there, or at least it's quite likely to. Um, and also every time when you're turning, when you're axing, when you're carving, the temptation if uh, something feels difficult, the cut feels difficult, is to like move the tool or move the material. And often, more times than not, it's really just the angle of the cutting edge that you're using. as I get down to the base. At this point, this feels harder to carve than it was to turn, so. So you're trying to get it flush? Yeah, I like to get it flush. If for some reason I'm worried about it being thin, then I would maybe leave it a little bit up. It's mostly aesthetic. It's not going, it's, your bowl's going to still work very well as a bowl. So that's the inside. If I were to, um, something to just be aware of with a lot of woods, if you don't do that right away, one, it'll be harder because it will dry, but also because of the oxidation, like soon this is gonna be the same color as the rest. But if I were to let the bowl dry before I uh, shave out the core and the bit on the bottom, then you'll actually, it'll have a different color. Sometimes you could use that intentionally. Now here, similarly, I'm going to work across the grain, you know, Sharif had a good point because there's little smudgy bits there. You might do that first so it doesn't get on your clothes or bowl or anything. But um, I'm going to hook, put my thumb of the hand that's using the tool. Now having a tall foot makes this much easier. Um, but I don't want to pull into my thumb. If you've done any spoon carving, you'll know this. If you haven't done any spoon carving, then um, this movement might feel a little tricky. You have a little less support than you did on the inside of the bowl, but I'm gonna use my non-dominant hand to help push a little so that I have more control. And I'm not trying to take off too much at any one time. I'm 
I mean, a lot of things like this, there's always kind of an alternate position that you can find. If it feels really uncomfortable, you can move it around and sweep across. With this tool that almost feels a bit more natural. <laughs> this bit I might actually be able to kind of chip off like that. And I haven't carved ash or turned ash in a really long time. It feels so different. I know I've said that a few times. Okay, looks good to me. Okay, are we ready? Oh, oh actually, <laughs> two things to talk about yes. before we have the finale. Oh, yes. <laughs> so number one, drying. Drying. Okay, so what, what is your personal process and maybe suggestions for drying? Well, um, as, as a basic rule, because uh, you're working with fresh wood, if you're working with fresh wood, you want it to dry slowly to prevent it from cracking. Cracking in wood is usually all based on mass relative to the speed at which it dries. So um, if you wanna be really safe, put it in like a cool place, maybe wrapped, put some shavings in here that you've just um, created or some dry shavings that you have, wrap it in a piece of cloth, put it in a paper bag. Um, you don't, you wanna put it in and amongst things that still breathe a bit so that it doesn't mold. Um, right now, with this particular bowl, with ash, I would leave it out. I wouldn't even be concerned about it. Um, it's, the moisture in this wood is already significantly out, again, because it's more of a porous wood. Um, it's going to be dry very fast. And a lot of that you kind of get a feel for. Sometimes, like certain seasons, certain where if it's like drying inside my house or when we are living in the van, it's, you get a feeling kind of for the moisture and temperature and I'll put it somewhere um, kind of cool and dark, like you would anything that you want to last for a long time, food and things like that. Um, and then check on it every day. But with this one, I would probably just set it on the shelf and even in a warm kitchen and I wouldn't worry about it. So a lot of it, like a lot of them, it, it depends on the wood and the weather and um, the thickness of your bowl. Um, kind of the thinner it is, there's already so much surface area to the mass that it's, it's drying in every direction already. So if it's a really windy, hot day, then I'm the most careful with it. I'm going to make sure it goes into shavings right away. If I take any breaks while turning, I'm either wrapping a wet towel around it or a jacket um, or taking it off the lathe and putting it into a bag or something like that. But in this case, this particular one, I would just let dry. Um, once it's dry, uh, there's, there's a whole load of possibilities and opinions and things about how to finish your wooden wear. Um, these days we use tongue oil, which is from a tree in China, I believe. And we've found with also conversation with some other makers that it seals the fastest and the best and has, a, it doesn't have much of a smell or flavor and it also doesn't change the color of the wood that much. Um, but also flaxseed oil is very, or linseed oil is very common, walnut oil. I tend to lean towards the camp of oils that will harden um, as they cure. Now, to properly cure, it either something on a shelf is going to take even weeks, potentially months, depending on the oil. Um, if your piece is really dry and you oil it with tongue oil, um, I know some people who have built some really simple kilns, like a box with a light in it, and overnight it seals. 
Um, whether it seals or not, I think, is really debatable because the most important thing is if you're using your bowl, you're going to have oils in it. When you touch it, when you eat with it, when you do, when you use it, the oil mostly keeps it kind of, it gives it a nice look and luster. And I think that's really the biggest selling point and of the most interest is the way that the oil makes the wood look. If you have a piece of wood or a bowl that you're not using at all, then you will want to re-oil it because it will keep it from drying out kind of too much um, with the way that the temperature in our houses and moisture changes. Um, that's how wooden things tend to crack. Okay, so one part of the bowl making process that you still have to take care of in order to reuse your mandrel is take off the core. If you were to leave it and let it dry, it might crack. It will likely crack just on its own. But what I do is I, I find the grain direction and get the end grain. So here again, you can see the rings. And then I just take my ax and kind of put it in and like I'm twisting it slightly as it lands in there and it'll usually crack off. You have to be more careful doing this if you do use a spike mandrel because you don't want your ax to hit that. So there are some other ways of potentially hammering it off or else, but otherwise, there you go. There's the core of your bowl, little beehive. <laughs> Okay, bonus feature. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people might not like this, but um, we're gonna split the bowl in half. I don't actually do this that often. I tend to stumble into it by pushing the limits of my turning and seeing how thin I can get or if I can get nests out of my bowls. And so I've definitely had a lot of bowls crack off the side or split down the middle from pushing what I can make and what I can accomplish on this style of lathe. But if you also don't have anything breaking or really if you, if you make any sort of craft as un, as a, what's the opposite of precious as unattached as you can be, I think there's a lot of space to learn within that. So. But you mentioned off camera, the ceramics. Yes, exactly. So in things like ceramics, it's very common that they'll split their pieces in half to look at the wall thickness and see how even their pulls are as they're throwing ceramics or building ceramics. Um, and so with this, I also want to split it to kind of show you what the cross section might look like. I, I'm not sure. I'm feeling it. I feel a little thick point here where it's going to get a little thicker, where if I was really working on this by myself, I probably would have been even more meticulous about it. And sometimes, you know, wall thickness, it's not always gonna mirror the outside shape of your bowl, depending on what kind of decoration and shape you do. So you're actually witnessing the first time I've intentionally <laughs> split a bowl. But not... I, I think maybe if I may, um, uh -huh. so when I was filming with Yoav al yeah. uh, a bowl turning video, yeah. what he mentioned was um, when he teaches, is that he always encourages his students to split their first bowl and even the bowls thereafter because what he encourages his students to do is just simply not get attached yeah. to the finished bowl but treat mm -hmm. it as a learning experience. Totally. I, when I, if I do a two-day course, uh, mostly say like spoon carving, we'll go through a whole process, we'll carve a spoon and then the next day when we come back, we start a new spoon. They can take it home and do what they want, but I encourage them not to be so precious about finishing that thing. I've also learned in some other crafts and basketry and such, like you always give away your first thing. And for some people, it's usually either difficult because they're really attached to it or they see all the flaws. So either way, I think it's a real gift to give it away, destroy it so that you can see what your work has come to and um, even compare it to further down the line. And as you go, I like I should in a way like do this more often because I think it's a really good way if you're wanting to grow within a craft to actually see what it's like because you're guessing what the cross section looks like. So I think I'm just going to use the axe. There we go. Ooh, there you go. Ooh, looks so nice. Okay, so, well, this bit flew into the dirt. But there, now you can see a cross section 
So you can actually see here that I got much thinner, so I would have tried to mirror that, my thinnest section, and had this meet that and that too. But that's what we just turned from a huge block of wood. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> I think I actually enjoyed that. And now I can make two little shelves. <laughs> Put them on a wall. Hold our business cards. <laughs> So there you have it my friends, that is a wrap for this video. Rally Klotzek, well done. Thank you. I always say this on my videos, if you've watched them previously, the less you hear me talking, it means the more amazing the maker is doing because you're explaining everything that needs to be said. And honestly, no matter how many times I form videos like this, I'm always learning. Yeah. And it's always great to see essentially the same product being made i.e. a bowl on a pole lathe, but the way you explain it, you have a different vantage point, a different viewpoint, mm -hmm. a different way of explaining the processes, etc. your thinking. So yeah, even for me filming, I've learned something, you know, today, spending Great. time with you. So guys, we want to do a broad recap now, rewinding back to the very beginning. As mentioned at the beginning, this video has been timestamped into all the various sections. Once again, it's a long video, but if you were to go learn this in person from Raleigh or her husband Oliver, it will be a full day course. Or two and, or three days. Or two or three, <laughs> right? And so this all has been broken down. We've worked hard to break this down into chapters. You can scroll along the timeline or the bottom of this video. Alternatively, in the description below, all the chapters are marked out. Once again, if you click on the times on the left-hand side, YouTube has a fantastic feature where it will jump straight to that section. The idea behind this is, is that hopefully Raleigh's video and tuition has inspired you, no matter what level you're at with your attorney, to kind of aid you on your journey. Also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is part one of a two-part series that I'm filming with Raleigh and her husband, Oliver. So in this part one, Raleigh has shown the complete process of turning a wooden bowl on this pole lathe. And in part two, her husband, Oliver, is going to be showing from start to finish his process for forging one of the hook tools that you've seen in this video as well. So the idea with the two combined is that it gives you all the information you need to get started. Now, as we mentioned throughout this video, obviously Raleigh and subsequently Oliver in the second video are showing you how to do these things. However, if you feel for one reason or another that you want to just kind of invest in maybe the components, the parts, or even finished bowls, the entire kind of like gamut, then obviously that is what these guys do. They work full time on this. And so you can acquire all of that from their website that will be linked to down below. Alternatively, and this is something I always encourage you to do, that listen, videos are fantastic. There's a lot of information you can garner. But at the end of the day, nothing beats in-person learning. Right, no matter what the discipline is, bowl turning, spoon carving, whatever. So if you have the opportunity to kind of spend time with Raleigh and her husband Oliver, I would genuinely and highly encourage you to do so. Like I said, they teach across Europe and the US. Um, so when you go to their website, you can see the list of different places that they teach. But also, I believe, and this is where you can kind of step in, that in Sweden, as you're getting established in Sweden, you have the ability for people to come over yeah. and learn from you in Sweden. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. So definitely in our transition of moving out of a van where we could really go to people, now we actually have a home and workshop that if you want to come and camp and take a workshop with us. Um, and also a lot of the places we teach often have some kind of accommodation as well. So you don't actually have to be local. You can weave it into trips. We've had we've had other people from the States and other countries actually come on a trip and come through a workshop on their way. So it's a really fun way to have a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it's just an excuse to visit Sweden. Right, that's, that's, that's going to be my excuse later in the year. Um, but like I said, I teach all over as well in, as at their residence in Sweden. All the information will be linked to down below on their website. Um, and lastly, if we get time today on my particular visit down to see Raleigh, uh, we may possibly film a bonus video. Yeah. Where she's going to teach, what are you going to teach? Broom making. Broom making. Broom making, right? It's the next new, it's not a new thing, but it's the next best thing in craft, I have to say. And it's something I've never <laughs> covered on my channel before. I'm not even seeing the process in its entirety. So if we are able, 
with Riley's kind permission to be able to film that. But this is another course that she's very popular and known for and teaching all over Europe and the US. Um, so if we get time for that, we are gonna be filming that hopefully today during my visit down to see Raleigh at this beautiful uh, woodland here in uh, the southeast of England. And if that video is already out by the time you're watching this, that will also be linked to down below. And finally, there's always a final thing with me, right? Yeah. The final thing being their festival, Fun Hand. Okay, so I'll link to that down below. All being well, at the time of recording this, this year in 2023, I really hope to be attending and to also document it. They've got some amazing, when I first saw the lineup of instructors on your website, I was like, mm. holy cow, you guys have actually got some really, really good tutors. I want to be a participant there. I know, I said, can I just put the camera down and attend some of the courses? Uh, but honestly, they really do have a fantastic location, fantastic teachers. Once again, details I will link down to, uh, below to a dedicated website from the Fon Han Festival itself. So as a final recap, links to everything down below. The second video in this two-part series, a potential bonus video with Riley talking about broom making, a uh, link to their website. You can find out information about buying all the components yourself, finding out about the courses and all the other things that they have going on. Like I said, Riley and her husband Oliver do this full time. Right, I cannot stress that enough. So they are really en engrossed um, and kind of live the life, right? As, as, <laughs> as kind of full-time craftspeople. And finally, a link to their Instagram. They're very, very active on Instagram. You can see the plethora of work that they get up to, both uh, past and also present. And the final thing I will add is if people have any questions mm -hmm. in regards to what's being shown, mm -hmm. as well as teaching, et cetera, et cetera, where is the best place for them to contact you? Is it your website? Is it Instagram? Is it both? Um, I would say it's both email or Instagram. On Instagram, oh, I feel messages can kind of get lost in either space, but um, more long form conversation, email. Um, if it's a quick question about some element that you're really trying to figure out, Instagram is something that I'm checking all the time. So, fantastic. Yeah. No, either pretty... one, you'll reach me. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get there one with you. Lastly, just send the carrier pigeon, they'll get it. <laughs> Once it gets to Sweden, they'll get the message. Um, the, I think one thing, just before we wrap up, I do need to stress is, um, and it's kind of a two-folded thing. Number one, everything that Riley has shown in this video is simply what works for Riley. Mm -hmm. uh, by no stretch of the imagination is she implying that this is the only way or the mm -hmm. best way. It's just what works for her. But considering how much Riley has turned, how much she's taught, you know, it's, it's suffice to say she obviously has a lot of experience that's brought her to this moment where she shared what works for her and I hope that would help you in some way, shape or form. And the last thing I really do want to wrap up on is how grateful I am to Riley for allowing me to document yeah. your good self. We've actually known each other for a while. I know, right? it's been five years. Yeah, it's been a long, long time. <laughs> so we all see each other at events and gatherings <laughs> and whatnot. We have a lot of mutual friends in the Greenwood working space. So I'm grateful that we finally had the opportunity on this beautiful day actually, yeah. which is rare at the moment in the UK. Mm -hmm. We've got loads and loads of rain. Um, but it's been great to finally meet up and to film and collaborate. But like I said, I really do appreciate you allowing me into your space to document and to share it with the wider public. Thank um, you. So that it will help Thank them. Thank you, you too. Yeah. Yeah. No. Of course. <laughs> thank pleasure. you so much. It's an awkward moment now. We're just saying thank you back and forth. So guys, there you go. That is a wrap for this video. Rolly, are there any last words from you in terms of an encouragement or whatnot in terms of what you've demonstrated throughout this video? If you're curious, give it a go. I think, yeah. Uh, you don't have to know what you're doing <laughs> to start. You definitely don't have to know what you're doing. It doesn't have to be perfect. That is a lot of the beauty of these kinds of crafts is that they are like the people's crafts and you can get a really long way with very little or a bunch of bits of scrap wood and the best wood is the wood that you can get your hands on. The best tools are the tools you can get your hands on. Riley started out as an apprentice. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, you yep. started out. I remember you were cooked, there in the early days. food, changed sheets. <laughs> that was it. And that was just for me, right? But it's like, <laughs> she's, but she started out as an apprentice and now look, teaching full time, renowned yeah. for her work that she's making as well. Um, when we were at the Bodgers Ball just recently, uh, bumped into a couple of students that took her courses as well as Oliver's and they all spoke highly, you know, of your tuition. I really mean that. Okay. So that was great to see. Yeah. So there you go, guys. That is a wrap for this video. I know it's a long outro, right? 
but there's a lot to cover, right? It's yeah. important for me to get it all kind of conveyed to you guys. So once again, links to everything down below. Highly, highly recommend you check out part two to this video where Oliver Klotzek, the, the accompaniment to Raleigh uh, Klotzek, is going to be showing from start to finish how to forge one of the amazing hook tools here. It's a process I've not seen myself in its entire routine in terms of Oliver doing it. Uh, so I'm really, really pumped to have that documented and to share with you guys. So there you have it. Rally, thank you once again. You're welcome. Thank you so thank much. You. The first American <laughs> craft person uh, on my channel. That was it. And what a performance. So there you go, guys. That's a wrap for this video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Rally Klotzek of Wild Crafting Workshop and myself, Zed Outdoors. Peace out.